gonna keep talking. I'm gonna keep. Hey, people in the back, can you hear me? I'm gonna guess not. Sorry, what? I think so. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> but it is coming through the. Hey Sue, can you just ask if if it's in fact on um, online on the streaming? Do you know what I mean? Because if we're if that's good, then we'll just go. Okay. I think. Okay. Okay. All right, team. Welcome, good, good evening. Um, so uh, we're gonna call this meeting to order. Um, and as I understand it, the, we're still, yep, we're still working on getting the, uh, the speakers turned on in the house, but apparently they're on online. So team, we're all just gonna have to, s to use our outdoor voices. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. Okay, <laughs> all right, so that the people in the back can hear. Is that, is that cool? And there are seats in the front if you wanna move to the front so you can hear better. Okay, outdoor voices, it's okay. Uh, all right, so um, the first thing is to uh, review and approve the agenda. Uh, we've got a few changes I'd like to make. Um, just a, a heads up, we should probably um, pull E, the, the school board appointment from the consent agenda, only because um, there are a few of us that I need to recuse ourselves, so just a heads up on that. Um, I think if just want to check the online uh, agenda. Uh, yep, uh, so online it has the housing task force update as being after the proposed parking garage structure design. Uh, I'd like to switch the order of that. Let's move the house, housing task force um, ahead of the parking garage structure. Um, and then of one, um, a couple other changes. The communication strategy, um, we're gonna move to the end just before other business. Uh, and then just a heads up on the, the Southern Vermont Solid Waste District uh, Municipal Services Program grant. Um, we are in fact not going to be applying right now. So um, uh, we can talk more about that. In fact, I'd, I'd love to like have a brief discussion about that later, but just so you know, the, the substance of that of like applying for a grant is not in fact happening. So. At least not right now. So those are all the changes I know about. Does anybody else have other changes they think uh, they, they'd like to see? No? OK, great. So uh, without uh, objection, we'll consider the uh, agenda approved. Uh, so moving on to general business and appearances. So this is a time for members of the public to come uh, speak to the council on any item that is not otherwise on our agenda. And uh, if you could, try to. Well, it, try to keep your uh, comments to about two minutes or less. And as with any comments, as is our uh, custom, uh, if you uh, come to, to comment on any item that is on our agenda, if you keep your comments to about two minutes or less, and Donna will be here and help us um, navigate <laughs> the time. And, and I, there's a little bit of grace in there, but I will cut you off eventually. So, um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, go ahead. Working? Yep, and if you'd say also say your name and where you're, you are from. Harris Webster from Montpelier. And so the people at home can hear you. Harris. <laughs> you're good. Harris Webster from Montpelier. I'm a member of the Kofitskis group. And I'm here on behalf of that to invite the city council, all city officials, and all the audience to participate in We Walk Week, which starts September 30th. Um, I, there's not many better ways that you can learn about your city than by walking in streets. Um, so I'm going to also mention one other thing, because I forgot it a week ago. I want to thank City Council Member Don Bate for participating in the pedestrian scramble last year and for her leadership, support of all the kind of alternate <laughs> transportation committees, including the 
Police Committee. Uh, it really feels good to have city council member there and, and listening to us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Harris. I'm Jeff Dworkin. Uh, I'm here with Kathy Metz. We live at 24 Liberty Street. We'd like to say a few words about the proposed parking ban on Liberty Street while the elementary school has its reconstruction going on. Um, the parking ban seems like a good idea for the reasons stated by Tom McArdle for safety and for large vehicles like the school bus to be able to pass because it is a fairly narrow street. Unfortunately, it's also spawned a problem. As, as, as reasonable as the measure is, the problem it's spawned is an old one. And just to give you a moment of history, some years ago, the residents of Lower Liberty Street uh, <coughs> drew up a petition and presented it to city council to request that speed bumps be installed because people fly down that street. And um, there are, I don't know how to count them, but there must be 100 school kids that walk down Liberty Street to one of the two schools twice a day. Um, the problem that the regulation is spawning is that we have had parking on both sides of the street which has acted as an informal traffic calming device. It sounds kind of odd, but it's been effective. I mean, when you have that street narrowed by parking on both sides, we can definitely see cars slowing down. Um, it may be kind of a ad hoc an unapproved calming device, but it has worked. Um, the problem now with a ban on one side of the street is cars are going to start flying down there like they, like they do when there isn't much parking on the, on the road. And it's a serious danger to the school kids that are walking to and from school twice a day. Um, we, we, we made that request quite a few, probably a dozen years ago to city council that speed bumps be investigated and put in. Council didn't act upon it. You have put in speed bumps in the meadows. Um, interestingly, there, it's, there's far less danger to school kids in the meadows. There's far less foot traffic there from the two, and to the two, two schools. But we're quite concerned about what uh, kind of a danger we're going to be inviting now that the street is wider in effect for passing traffic. So we are here to ask that the school that the um, council reconsider speed bumps by way of perhaps referring it to the public works department to come back with an opinion about whether, like in the meadows, but even more importantly on Lower Liberty Street, speed bumps can be um, investigated with an opinion back about whether it's feasible. Uh, one way or another, with a wider street and, and inevitably faster traffic, we, we seriously believe that a greater danger to school kids is being invited and should be headed off. Thank you for that comment. Um, so just as a um, little bit of information about that, so there are a number of places in Montpelier that have requested speed bumps and uh, the as a response, uh, well let me back up, one of the reasons why um, not a lot of speed bumps have been put in place is because uh, there, there hasn't been a really clear process of how we go about deciding where to put them and how do we vet them properly with the public and uh, with, uh, you know, in, in being informed with a DPW process. And so we had actually tasked the uh, Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee to come up with a process to determine whether or not speed bumps were appropriate. Now, because this is a temporary measure, it may make some sense to sort of evaluate that um, separately. And I mean, I know uh, speed bumps can be put in uh, on a temporary basis. So that seems like a... Um, uh, at least a worthwhile thing to look into. So if we can just make a note of um, checking in on that, that'd be great. Thank you. May I just ask for a point of information? Sure. Um, what does checking into it mean? Uh, we can ask uh, Tom McArdle about whether or not we can go outside that process and speed up, um, you know, just the process looking at whether or not we can do this as a temporary measure. And particularly what I would be interested in is looking at um, temporarily installing speed bumps on Liberty Street. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Donna. 
but there are <coughs> other elements of traffic calming, and that's one of the things this transportation group is looking at, the whole picture, and trying to have a real clear process. And so even without that, though, DPW would want to look at it holistically, what would be the best way to slow people down. And that and makes sense. I'm just, um, yeah, no. I'm, I'm just asking the, the council to pay special attention to that new problem because of the traffic of school yep. children in yep. that area. Great, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I'm glad he asked what does checking into it mean because I want to ask directly are we going to get the crosswalk shimmed to drain before this winter snow and ice season? Because you want to introduce yourself? Steve Whitaker, uh, I'm up here Thank related you. to uh, the safety of having water back up into the crosswalks and freeze. Mm -hmm. And I called it to city manager's attention over a year ago, right after the paving was done. And it's it's been ground, but it hasn't been shipped. Mm -hmm. Secondly, and tonight it's very obvious that the priority on getting the system tuned, I looked at the minutes, and the minutes give very short shrift to the issue of crosswalks. I complained about the crosswalks. It doesn't get into the detail, which means we're relying on the video, and the video without audio is deficient. So we really need to get this room tuned quicker so that particip people can meaningfully participate here from fr anywhere in the room. And that's not something that uh, can be put off month after okay. month. Thank you. If I might, it's just yeah. worth a reminder because this pops up every now and then. I follow what's considered best practices and take action minutes. Um, so I don't characterize what people say or I do as minimally as possible and that's considered I best practice. Just, just so you know, they're I, I'm saying that it's okay to rely on the video, mm -hmm. but only if you're getting good video with audio. Mm -hmm. So, yep. And um, just so you know, Bill has been out for the last week, so we'll I'll follow up with him about that. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Anything further? Okay. Move it. Oh, yep. Go ahead. I'm not clear whether we're on the agenda or not. Okay. Well, what, what topic did you want to speak Sam about? Sam and I are he, we're from Montpelier. We're here, my name's Laura. We're here from um, the Citizens Against Plastic Pollution Group. Is that charter change? Thing it is on not the, on the agenda tonight. Not on the agenda. Tonight. And we will not be taking it up tonight. All right. Yeah. And I also just wanted to thank you for sending us the stuff about the grant. And I think we are going to apply for the grant for our citizens group. Great. For and do you, do you want to clarify what the grant is the about? The grant is for. Um, Reduce, reducing solid waste in the in our town. And what we're asking for is, and what the charter change is about, is about banning single-use plastic bags in Montpelier. And so what we would apply for the grant, what we wanted to ask for was money to get a bunch of um, reusable sh shopping bags made that we will hand out for free. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. Okay, anyone else? Great, okay, moving on. Uh, consideration of the consent agenda. I move the consent agenda as amended. <coughs> as amended. Okay, you got it. Uh, further discussion? Um, do we, uh, right, when do we recuse ourselves? No, um, well, as amended was less, was less that was less item. That. I'm just well, thinking, okay, so we'll, so we'll, we'll recuse the ourselves next. next. Okay, great, thank <laughs> you. Uh, all right, so no further discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. And I'm going to recuse myself for this next bit. <laughs> all right. Uh, so I believe that takes us to the consideration of the appointment for the um, school. Yes. Uh, I'm. Is it, First is time it? anyone's ever said that to you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's not usually, I'm usually, can you please be quiet? Um, so at this point, we are now going to take up the appointment to the uh, school board. I believe that there's only the one applicant. Um, Andrew, I believe, is here. Would you like to address the council on the public, or? I don't think it's necessary. Just wanted to give you the opportunity. Um, Okay, so I suppose at this point, do we have a motion? I move to appoint uh, Andrew Stein to the uh, Montpelier Roxbury School Board. And a second? Second. Any further discussion? Um, I'm going to recuse myself because of my job with the Agency of Education. Okay. Okay, I think we have enough. I'll have to recuse myself too as uh, 
employee of Vermont NEA? Oh, I don't know. We won't have enough. Fine. Well, I think. I, I, I I'm also know. recusing myself. Right. Four. But can I vote? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wasn't sure. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, all right. So any further discussion? All right. All those in favor of appointing Andrew Stein? Please aye. say aye. 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 Uh, nay. Votes, none. Abstentions, I believe there are three. And that would be Connor Casey, uh, Mayor Ann Watson, and Councillor Rosie Kruger. Didn't abstain. They excused themselves. We're recused. That's okay. They, they rec That's okay. He'll get it. Okay. It'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's thank you. Different. Thanks for Great coming. Great job. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have a few appointments to make. So the first up is uh, the Planning Commission. Uh, appointments. Um, so if any members of the Planning Commission are here or um, uh, people who would like to be appointed to the Planning Commission, um, now would be a good time to introduce yourself. And there are two seats or two types of seats um, in this situation. So um, if you have preferences as to, uh, I'm not looking at it, I think it's either one year or two year. Um, if your preference is either for the one year or the two year seat, if you could express that, that would be very helpful. So come and introduce yourself. That'd be great. Uh, just and, and a process question. Yes. C can we hear all three groups that are having appointments so we have one executive session? Sure. That's fine. Is that uh, okay with everyone? Okay, go ahead. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Staff, and Council. My name is Brian Evans. Um, I'm a resident of Montpelier. I live up on Elm Street. Uh, I put my name in for the, the Planning Council Commission um, just because I want to give back. I'm doing my best. I don't know if this mic is getting back there. Mm -hmm. I, I, could, I could speak into it, but I don't know if it's coming yeah, through the speakers. Yeah, that's better. All right. So um, I work for the State of Vermont Department for Children and Families. I'm the financial director. Um, I've been involved in public policy, uh, planning work from a capital construction point of view. I have a, a sort of diverse skill set that I think would be very valuable to the commission and just put my name in for consideration and thank you. Any questions? Great. Thank you. I guess I'll hold it. Good evening everyone. I'm Leslie Welts. Um, can you hear me back there? Okay. Uh, I'm the current chair of the Planning Commission, and everyone on the Planning Commission, I believe, has entered their name seeking reappointment. And I just want to say the group is working really well together, and I would be you know, supportive of every single member of the Planning Commission being reappointed. I think we have, we cross a lot of demographics right now with our group. We have a lot of thoughtful discussion, and uh, it's sort of an exciting time uh, we're starting our work on the new city plan. We had a, a great meeting with a lot of various committees, and some of you are in attendance at the meeting. Thank you for coming. And uh, those of you who weren't there, I mean, I guess everyone stay tuned because we're going to keep working on that process. Um, and the, the immediate work, I'll just use this as a quick update since <laughs> I'm here. Uh, the immediate work that we're, we're working on right now, and I'm sure Mike Miller has been keeping you appraised, is... Um, doing zoning fixes as they work through, as they receive permit applications, they're realizing there are some difficulties here and there. And so we've identified a few items that probably need to be sent to you immediately for immediate correction and some others that we'll send more as a package later. So thank you. I, I guess if there's any questions, of course. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Leslie. Don is very strict. <laughs> I, I put the sign up quietly. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Well, I think uh, Leslie took care of that, but um, I'm Barbara Henry. I'm a current member of the Planning Commission, and I'm uh, very excited about the work that we're doing on the, the city plan and really look forward to being able to continue. So, thanks. Thank you. Questions? Hi, I'm Kim Cheney. I sent you all a note saying um, I'm going to be away for a good part of the winter. I don't want any special treatment if that's an absolute requirement. 
then uh, I wouldn't be qualified. On the other hand, if possible, I'd like to serve. I think uh, kind of being at the beginning of the zoning process and working with a prior plan and seeing how it worked out, and more importantly, working with Mike and the planning department and the fellow commissioners, I do think we have the opportunity to have a really productive group. And it's fun to work with. So if I can be of service to the city, I'd like to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Stephanie Smith. I live over on Charles Street. Um, I'm a current member of the Planning Commission. I was appointed back in February, so I'm one of the two newest members of the Planning Commission. Um, but it's been it's been a really great experience so far, getting to getting caught up on what happened with the zoning since I missed what actually happened. But now talking through the punch list, um, and I'm I'm a planner, so I'm particularly excited about getting to work on the city plan. I currently I work for the state of Vermont, doing climate change adaptation planning uh, at a state level. So it's good to be able to bring that to a more local perspective and work with my planning experience on the community where I live and help to, to make continue to keep this a vibrant place. So I would very happily uh, stay on the Planning Commission. I'm, I'd like to really be part of that process going forward. So thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Kirby Keaton. I'm currently the vice chair of the Planning Commission. Um, also, your representative to the Regional Planning Commission. So, if you have any questions about the Regional Planning Commission, what's going on there, you can talk to me. You can always talk to Mike about these things too. He stays abreast. Uh, I have a. I'm an attorney. I work uh, for the Department of Taxes. Um, I have some background in land use law, environmental law. Uh, that's kind of what I bring. Um, that's it. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Aaron Kosicki. I am not a current member of the Planning Commission, um, and apparently I'm applying for the most popular commission. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit about myself. I'm also an attorney for the state. Uh, I have uh, a number of years working for the Department of Public Service. There was a lot of, I, I undertook a lot of review and analysis of town plans and uh, zoning bylaws, so I figured this would be a good fit um, for that skill set, and I think there's a lot of uh, the development that's been going on in the city, particularly for the past year and a half, two years, is exciting and it's creating a lot of vibrancy in the town. I'd like to be a part of that and uh, thanks for your consideration. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, also on our list is appointments to the Design Review Committee. So uh, is there anyone here for, for that? Nope, okay. Gonna move right along then. Um, Recreation Advisory Board. Uh, good evening, I'm Peter Cohen. I live up on Mountain View Street. Um, first time applying for this position or any similar one, but I'm relatively new to the area. I've been here two plus years and just trying to get involved and looking at this from the perspective of a parent. I have three stepchildren and then a younger two-year-old as well. And uh, the recreation, mostly sports, but other activities have been pretty important in, to our introduction to this area. And just, um, I guess, from being involved myself and from observing, there's things that I really like and things that I've had questions about and just would like to be involved in, in helping out and kind of moving into the future. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Heather Bailey, and I'm a, a resident of Montpelier, and I'm applying to be on the um, Recreation Advisory Board. I have a tremendous background in physical education as I was a teacher, coach, and athlete. <laughs> and I'm also involved with the, blunt, blunt, the Jump Splash Initiative. And I would like to be involved with the Recreation Advisory Board. I don't have children at home, but <laughs> I certainly um, am interested in youth. Thank you. I think there was at least one more applicant for this. If they're here. Nope, okay. All right, I think that is it. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, uh, yes, Rosie. I move that we go into executive session for the purpose of, uh, oh, in accordance with uh, 1 VSA section 313. I'm sorry, Rosie, I can't even hear you. Oh, I move that we go into an executive session for the purpose of an appointment uh, in accordance with 1 VSA section 313. Second. Great. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we will be right back. I move that we appoint for uh, the four two-year terms, Leslie Welts, Barbara Conry, Kirby Keaton, and Stephanie Smith. And for the three one-year terms, John Adams, Ariane Kasim, and Aaron Kaziki. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Right. And I just want to say um, directly to, to Kim Cheney, thank you so much for your service since 2011. Uh, we're, just, we're so grateful. And, um, and best of luck in all your travels. <laughs> um, and I also want to um, invite um, anyone who, well, I, I guess I'm speaking to, to Brian now, but anyone who um, was not uh, appointed, want to specifically invite you to apply for the um, uh, design Review Committee as there are um, positions there that we're still looking to fill. So um, thank you so much to all. All right. And so moving on, on Design Review Committee. All right, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to appoint Liz Pritchett as the alternate on the DRC. Second. Uh, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you so much. And the uh, Recreation Advisory Board. I move that we appoint Peter Cohn and Heather Bailey to the Recreation Advisory Board. Second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Congratulations both, and uh, thank you for committing to serve. All right, so moving on, we're going to uh, go to the Housing Task Force update. Uh, so I think I'm, you know who you are, and I'm going to invite you all up. Me is Polly Nickel, and we're the co-chairs of the Housing Task Force. Um, this is the first time we've appeared before this council. Um, so what we'd like to do is kind of give you just a, um, a quick overview of what the Housing Task Force does, what we're up to um, currently, and then talk a little bit about one of the tools that we oversee, the Housing Trust Fund, and make some recommendations as you head into the, um, into the budget season. And with us in the crowd today are other members of the task force, Jim Libby and Liz Genge and Mary Alice um, Bisbee and um, Joe Triano and Representative Hooper off, also often join us along with others on occasion. So we're grateful for their contributions. Um, so th actually throughout the presentation you'll see a sprinkling of pictures from various housing, affordable housing um, neighborhoods and properties around the community. Um, and here is a picture of the groundbreaking for Taylor Street, which is very exciting and now underway. And then on the bottom are North Branch Apartments, um, which are along Elm Street and were um, redeveloped by Down Street Housing um, and Housing Vermont some number of years ago. So you're familiar with this, but our basic job is to advise the city council on housing issues. Um, we also have the specific task of developing guidelines for the use of the housing trust fund, and then we make recommendations around that to you. Um, we'll be doing that a little later on, um, um, in addition to recommending funding levels for the trust fund. Um, and basically what we're about is trying to promote an adequate supply of safe, decent housing that's affordable. Um, at a range of income, so it really can serve everyone in our community. Uh, and we're supported by the Department of Planning and Community Development, and um, most specifically by Kevin Casey. Things that we're working on right now um, include uh, developing um, recommendations to you for an update uh, to the guidelines that uh, provide for the oversight and use of the Housing Trust Fund. Um, that was something I think you discussed a few months ago and thought maybe there needed to be a revision and an update, so we're happy to dive into that. And there's a subcommittee that's work working on that. We'll bring those back to you when it's um, a good time for you later in the year. Uh, we're also, um, we participated in the kickoff meeting that the Planning Commission held around the new city plan. And um, we'll be coordinating with them around the housing element or the housing chapter of that. 
and uh, we'll be supporting and looking um, the Good Samaritan Haven as they enter into the second year of um, hosting with Bethany Church the, um, the warming shelter and seeing if there are things that we can do to help, um, help them with that work. So as part of the uh, planning commission process, we went through the development of what, are, what should the city's goals be or the housing task force goals be for housing. Um, it's pretty detailed. They're structured as aspirations in order to be consistent with other committees. And essentially it's about we want to have enough housing available and affordable to serve the people of our community. We want housing that's safe, healthy, energy efficient, and in neighborhoods that are vital and have easy access. Um, um, for people that are accessible and also to allow people to easily access um, the important elements of our community. And then finally, we want housing that's available to all, that's absent um, discrimination, and that provides for a really inclusive community. So all pretty basic stuff, but it's important to have it um, down somewhere so you can reference it and look back to it. So things that happen in the housing world and the housing market go far beyond our city borders, but, um, and much of it is, I know we're at, we're at the whim of larger economic trends and things that we can't really control, but there are lots of things that municipalities can do, and Montpelier is already doing a lot of them, and they're in these kind of four general areas around regulation. Um, and a per examples of that are permitting, we've just updated the zoning, um, building codes help set the stage for um, the kind of housing that can happen in our community. Um, there's of course planning um, through the master plan, but also housing and economic development strategies that people are um, updating and working on. And of course funding is an important element and that happens through the housing trust fund, but also in terms of how the city chooses to fund infrastructure. The TIF district is an example of that. And then um, by being willing to sponsor and secure or apply for state CDBG grants, that brings a lot of resources. So that's another way in which the community supports um, housing here. And then there's education. So one example of that is the Montpelier Housing Task Force um, helped host a community conversation on homelessness uh, about a year and a half ago, I think. Um, and I think that helped people understand what was happening um, in our community. We were seeing more homelessness. A lot of people was concerned. What can we do about it? Um, what's the best way to help people? What isn't helpful? Um, and then I think that it actually helped make the community um, more welcoming um, to, the, to the warming shelter when that was proposed. Another example of education is just how does the city talk about housing? How does it represent itself to developers? How does it um, communicate with people who come in for permits? How does it characterize what kind of funding is it going to be for housing? It all sends a message to sort of the external um, world about the city's intention around housing. Another example is just that we just got an email um, today from Jim Libby that the um, um, the federal tax reform included some incentives for um, private building owners to um, sprinkle their buildings. So maybe we'll look into that and the housing task force can have a session and encourage people to come and, and um, see if that's one way in which we can um, get some of our older buildings um, sprinkled that aren't currently. Remind me when you're going to jump in here. So housing's all about the people who live in it. Fundamentally, it's a, it's a basic need. We need to provide it for our citizens. Um, if you don't have a safe, decent, stable place to live, you really can't get much of anything else in your right, else right in your life. You can't be a good citizen. You can't be a good parent. You can't be a good student, employee, um, advocate. So that's the primary purpose. But housing is also the foundation for lots of other benefits and public goods that we want to see in our community. Um, and these are some examples. So, for example, when Montpelier supports um, an affordable housing um, development or new neighborhood that comes with a high standard of energy efficiency and often includes renewable energy sources as the heating. That's been the case in many instances. Um, diversity is another thing we don't always think about when we think about making sure there's enough affordable housing in our communities. Uh, but not only does it ensure economic diversity, but it also brings um, cultural diversity. Often new Americans that first come to, the, um, first come to Vermont um, from different parts of the world, either refugees or others, can find their first homes. They're, I mean, they're just getting their feet under them. Um, and often they need affordable housing to, as a place to land and um, build their lives here. In fact, the property that you see here in the background, the top 
is a picture of what the North Branch apartments looked like long ago. Um, it was an incredibly distressed, blighted, and then ultimately flooded um, section of Elm Street, and it uh, took um, a concerted effort on the part of many, led by Downstreet Housing and Community Development, to revitalize that. Um, in time, that became home to many of people who were um, fleeing um, um, the wars in Central Europe, and there were a lot of um, Bosnian and Serbian families who lived there for quite some time. That's just one example. It's also an example of neighborhood revitalization. You can see that many of the affordable housing projects that we do end up in um, historic buildings, so that um, meets that goal of keeping the historic character and, and preserving unique um, spaces and places in our community. Um, whenever there's a, uh, a project like that that's done, um, it brings dollars along to deal with lead, asbestos, often brownfields. Some of the um, properties that I'll show you in a little bit um, were on contaminated sites, and those, those projects bring along resources in order to clean that up that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do or be hard-pressed to do. Those dollars, those can be really expensive. And then it grows the grand list. Um, you saw the memo that, that Polly and the task force prepared. There's lots of information in there. Um, but it's pretty substantial, the grand list growth that um, the affordable housing projects in Montpelier have contributed. So all that's great. So what's the challenge? What are we looking at here in Montpelier? And these are sort of the, the main things we're wrestling with. And so, and they're all going to sound familiar to you. Rising rents, um, rising home prices, very low vacancy rates, a shortage of moderately priced homes, and there's, you know, statistics and data around that in the memo, um, and unfortunately, persistent homelessness. There had been a dip in statewide homelessness and in Washington County in 2015. It bumped up in 2016, again in 2017, and it's remained kind of level in 2018. So it's a problem that hasn't gone away. Um, so these, these challenges are consistent with national trends, but they're exacerbated by Montpelier being a highly desirable place to live. That's, that's putting pressure on our housing prices, both rental and home ownership. Um, this is a quote that just kind of characterized that. It's from um, the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard, lots of data there, but it kind of puts what we're experiencing here in Montpelier in the national context. A shorter quote comes from Sean Donovan, who was um, President Obama's Secretary of HUD, who said he declared that the nation um, was in a rental housing affordability crisis that the, is the worst that the nation's ever seen, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, so we feel the pinch here in Montpelier. If Montpelier hadn't done what it has done, it would be a lot worse. So um, some of the mechanisms we have in place are helping. And here are some signs of recent progress. So created a successful home buyer program. Um, gone through the zoning update, which has reduced some of the barriers to housing development. Um, the sprinkler ordinance was seen by many as a barrier to um, um, new homes being built. Um, there are several housing um, projects underway. There's the French Block, Taylor Street. Um, there's a private project on Maple Lane down by um, River Station Condos and the co-op. All those are really encouraging signs. The warming shelter has been welcomed and successful in the first year. Um, and the city has very strong partners in Downstreet Housing and Community Development, the Montpelier Housing Authority, and the Good Samaritan Haven, um, among others. Paul, is there anything you wanted to add here? Or I can just run through a few examples of... Yeah, of okay, and then turn over. Okay, so um, here's a few quick shots of properties that the Housing Trust Fund has been used to invest in before. Um, 58 Berry Street, Old High School. Many of you will remember that there was a fire there um, some years ago and a um, lot of conversation around how are we going to restore this building, what should it be. Um, there were housing trust fund dollars um, helped um, bring other state and federal sources. Um, the city applied for community development block grant um, and that is now 18 affordable senior <coughs> apartments gorgeous apartments, which is what you sometimes get in um, historic properties, and then, of course, an incredibly active um, um, senior center. So the Housing Trust Fund was a key element in that. And I, um, my day job is as I'm working for a housing funder, and I can say if the uh, dollars are really competitive, really um, um, lots of communities are stepping up and looking for those state and federal dollars, and if the funders don't see that a community is willing to invest in itself, 
they're not likely, um, they're less likely to, put, to want to commit their, um, the dollars that they have to, to those communities. Um, this one's a little bit further down on Berry Street, called the Bianchi Building, was formerly um, an auto, um, bond auto parts. It was vacant for a time. You can see it's all boarded up, um, but again, it's been um, redeveloped and is now is eight affordable apartments. Right across the street were River Station Apartments and condominiums that was in a former industrial site, Brownfield, hazardous contamination, um, and the city played a really central role in helping to um, make that possible and and now it you know when you think about it those are affordable desirable homes that are on um, a section in a part of our community that is changing a lot you can see a lot of people investing along Berry Street there's Caledonia Spirits happening you can see people investing in the buildings the privately owned buildings all around these properties and I think when our community continues to grow the bike path it's going to happen down that corridor and it's really fortunate that the city has invested in affordable housing here, and those are required through housing subsidy covenants to stay as affordable housing. So there's always going to be a place for people of all incomes in that part of our community. And this is the one that's underway right now. Um, the French block, um, 175,000 in housing trust funds, helped secure a total of six million in state and federal funding for 18 mixed income apartments. There'll be some dedicated to the homeless, there'll be some um, that are market rate and just rented at fair market rents and it's um, clearly right in the heart of our, our community. It's just across the street. And I think this is where I'll pretty much finish up. But so the housing challenges, I mean, government can't do everything, but government must provide public funding to provide housing where the private market can't do it. And the private market can't build housing and rent them at affordable rents and cover their costs. So that's why government needs to put in subsidy, essentially, and that's what the city's doing when they support the housing trust fund. Um, and also, the private sector can't take on challenges. These are pictures of the upper floors of the French block. There's lead, there's asbestos. There's more lead paint hazard there than even the equipment our lead program has could even measure. Um, it was a really challenging layout, and for 70 years, the private sector wasn't able to step in and, and make that work, and so it's taken the public funding to do that, and it's going to be a real resource for us. So those are examples of what the Housing Trust Fund has been able to support in the past. And now, Polly will talk about the Home Buyer Program. Okay, well, I wanted to just spend a few minutes digging a little deeper into the Housing Trust Fund, and um, in the, the Housing Task Force truly believes that the trust fund needs a predictable and growing pot of money. And as Jen said, it's really been key to re uh, redevelopment of projects in Montpelier. Um, $635,000 has been spent since 2007 when the trust fund started, and it, but that has generated an additional $4.3 million for the city's grand list. And when the French block is completed, that number will go up. Um, and that $4.3 million is almost $120,000 annually in new taxes. And as Jen said, it's, it's leveraged tens of millions of dollars in state and, and private investments. Um, to remind you of the, what the Economic Development Strategic Plan says, it calls for a variety of housing types, quote, to build the pipeline of workforce talent, and it also says an adequately funded trust fund will be an important tool in financing the variety of housing types called for in this strategic development, in this economic development strategic plan. So, um, brief history, it was in the memo, it began in 2007 as one cent for housing, and the public support, it was a ballot item, and, and the support was so strong that after a few years, um, the council decided it should just be part of the city budget. Um, Jen showed you um, some of the projects um, that it has funded, and it has also funded a program, which is the first time um, home buyer program. In terms of projects, the trust fund has facilitated the creation of 94 uh, new multi-family units, mostly apartments, but some condos, and the purchase of 16 homes by um, first time home buyers. So, um, we think that both programs are important. Uh, the multifamily rentals bring 
lots of investment and resources to the city. They clean up blighted or vacant properties. They add to the housing stock. Um, and it's an important tool to maintaining an economically and culturally diverse community. And um, as we said, it adds to the grand list. The First Time Home Buyers Program encourages young families to buy in the city. It enables older homeowners to downsize, and it um, puts kids in our schools, and it brings in state aid um, to education. And the um, community development staff did a little survey of people who had received first time home buyer program money in the past, and um, here are just a few of the results. 75% of those surveys uh, reported the program made them more interested in buying in Montpelier. 75% said it made it possible or helped them to afford a home in our community, and 87% said it was the best form of first-time home buyer assistance as opposed to do something else like a rehab uh, loan. So um, just a couple quotes. Um, one simply said the first-time home buyers uh, down payment assistant program made it possible for my family to purchase a home in Montpelier. But this one um, I think really captures it. Scratching together the down payment was difficult, especially trying to save while paying off student loans. That coupled with childcare costs and decent but not great wages. We looked at other local communities that were less expensive, mainly Barry and Barrytown. But with the down payment assistance, we were able to move to Montpelier, thanks. And, and that just, I think, captures the essence of, of the program and, and what we're hoping for. So um, what, are, what do we think the, the trust fund needs? Um, we had a long conversation at the housing task force about you know how much we should ask for and, and what we decided was we would start with what we really thought was needed um, to keep it healthy to fund a multifamily development like the French French block every two to three years and to have a modest first-time home buyer program and the number we came up with was hundred and fifty thousand and we know that's a bold request but um, that's that's what we think um, is really needed um, and in the memo and we're not going to take your time to go through it today we did give you some suggestions that have been used elsewhere in the country um, by other municipalities to generate money to support affordable housing um, to date it's come from the general fund it would be great to maintain a base allocation from the general fund but there's also some some other I um, ideas that we've laid out for you to explore um, it, it, to, to augment it. So just um, in conclusion on the trust fund, I, I just, you know, we want to say we think it's been highly successful. The, the photos that Jen has uh, shown you have illustrated that. It's leveraged millions of dollars in other resources. It's allowed the city to demonstrate to funders of specific projects its commitment to providing affordable housing. It's restored vacant or underutilized properties. It's added to the housing stock. It's added to the grand list. The First Time Home Buyers Program has enabled young families with children to buy homes in the city. And many of these families would not have been able to do so without help from the fund. It's also, and I think this is really important, it sent a message that Montpelier wants to encourage young families to move to the city. I mean, realtors know about it. They talk about it. It's, 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 it's a positive message on behalf of the city. So we also wanted to say thank you to the council um, for the past support of, of the trust fund. And we hope that as you begin to build next year's budget, you'll seriously consider a request for increased funding and look at our uh, suggestions for ways um, that that might be accomplished. And I just wanted to close with um, this picture. And the, the little boy there is my father. And he's sitting on um, the front porch of their apartment on Berry Street. And he lived in um, rental housing um, through his childhood. His dad worked on the railroad and helped build 89. His dad's dad was a mailman. And his dad's dad's dad um, was the station master at the depot building across from Shaw's. And it wasn't until um, I was 10 and my, when my parents were able to buy their first home. And they bought um, a ranch on Berlin Street. And it was from there that they were actually be able to build some equity and some assets and they were able to provide opportunities for my sister and I and then ultimately our kids that that um, that he and um, his
previous family hadn't been able to um, enjoy. But the reality is that my family, or people who have those kinds of professions, couldn't afford to live in Montpelier now. Um, so I think, and then there are a lot, of, and they were, I mean, they were fine. But they couldn't afford to live in Montpelier, and there's a lot of people who struggled and had less than they did who certainly couldn't afford to live in Montpelier. So I think it's really important that we stay mindful of making sure that our community is a place where people of all walks of life can live and make their lives. And that's it. Thank you so much. So, um, questions? Yes, Rosie. So, I have one question. I read your memo and I was interested and intrigued in the, by the idea of a property transfer tax um, on housing, uh, houses sold above $500,000. And I don't know if you did any research or if um, maybe city staff can look into whether a charter change would be required in order for us to implement that. I think it might be. And before we kind of investigate that idea further, I would that would be an important piece of information. Yeah. And that was Mary Hooper's sense that mm, she said, yeah, I think it would require a charter change. Okay. <laughs> so that would be, I would be interested in having city staff look into that a little bit more if others are interested in that. I was also interested in that one. And, and part of the theory behind that is there aren't a lot of sales yet <laughs> in that price range, but you can just see them creeping up. There's a lot in the $400,000 range now. And um, information that the Regional Planning Commission gave us said there were 29 properties in Montpelier that are residential properties that are valued over uh, 500000 So, um, you know, it seems like the time to do it is, is, is now. Where are you and I, I would assume that if we did, we would um, put a tag it to inflation and, you know, that sort of thing. But I think a first step is to figure out if we even have the power to do it. And if we don't, then that makes sense to me further. Yeah, we should definitely look into that. Uh, Rosie, I mean, Rosie, Donna. <laughs> I was interested, why the 500,000 and not the 400,000 that we have more? Uh, so I just, is there some parallel of no. other communities doing this at that level? No, it, it was, it just, you know, it's a nice round number and <laughs> it, 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 it also seems that at that level then then that's not going to create a hardship for anybody yeah. who's paying that amount and maybe it's okay for them to provide some funding to help for people who aren't yeah. able to buy a five hundred thousand dollar house yeah or four hundred yeah. <laughs> yeah okay so we yeah. could possibly play with that yeah yeah but there's there are no a lot of houses that you would think of you know that just would you know three four bedrooms that you know a family might need that are in the four hundred thousand range now Ashley. I just wanted to thank you. It seems as though the Housing Task Force over the years has been really mindful of the impacts of gentrification on communities. Um, and I, I think that uh, while well-intentioned, often gentrification leads to a, a complete lack of diversity. Um, and it's clear that that's something that your committee has considered. And I think that the council is also really trying to work on. But I just I felt it important to acknowledge that uh, it seems like people in town are aware of that and are actively working to prevent that from happening in our community. Uh, Connor. Sort of along the same lines, I've been working with the Community Justice Center, mm -hmm. and the biggest thing I've noticed is some of the folks getting out of prison, you know, on probation or parole. Um, really, the, the key to their success is, you know, being back in their communities where they have that support system, and we see people getting sent back to prison just because they can't find uh, proper housing. So I'm just sort of curious, are there conversations with the Community Justice Center in cases where there are publicly funded like housing units available? Are there restrictions put on somebody with a criminal history? I uh, just want to make sure these folks have a you know, shot when they do get out here. Eileen or Lisk. Yeah, it is a little tricky because if there's federal funding, unfortunately, you can't have ever had a meth lab in your house and you can't have a criminal record are the two things right. that... Um, um, so those are, um, but I think that there are some ways there can be an appeal and some, some things that can be done, but it does present a challenge. But I do know that the Community Justice Center has been in touch around some of those things, and that's certainly a population we want to serve. And I think Liz, who's the property manager for Downstreet, yeah. wanted to no, answer that, if that's okay. Hi, thanks for that. So I work at Downstreet Housing, and I'm also on the task force. And yes, they can, Chris, can you um, say your name? Speaking with us about hey, Liz. Can you say your name? Liz Genge from Downstreet Housing. Great, thank you. Um, and also a member of the task force. I'm glad a great public speaker. 
<laughs> but I did want to just say that uh, the Community Justice Center of Montpelier came to us and will be presenting to our staff, and we are going to be uh, master leasing some of our market rate units. And similarly, we do that with the Youth Service Bureau, we do that for um, the Smarted Shelter, so things like that, those partnerships, like one household at a time. Thanks very much. Anyone else? Jack. This isn't a question, but I just want to observe, we've got two new co-chairs, and I've been on the housing task force for a long time, and I go to the meetings now. There's tremendous, very positive energy. The people on the task force are uh, very knowledgeable and experienced, and it's. I think things are going as well with the task force as they have gone in maybe ever and it's a real contribution to the community. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I guess I would just add, I mean, you did um, in your memo include some alternate um, funding mechanisms as well. And I'm, I'm certainly interested in you know, having a conversation about what's the right level of funding. You know, is it 150,000? Uh, 150, um, and I think that probably the best time to have that conversation is around budget um, time, but i um, looking forward to to that, but then also thinking about these other avenues as well. And I just wanted to um, put out there that, um, that I, I would be, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm obviously just speaking for myself here, but like I would be interested in um, having a further conversation um, around, uh, you know, the, the, gosh, it was like one, two, and. <laughs> Uh, three and four. Anyway, uh, <laughs> what were they? So it was uh, the reinvestment of a percentage of revenue from um, added value, value added um, due to uh, y'all's in investment. Um, the second one is uh, reinvesting a percentage of, of new revenue from um, development in general. I think you know that's I think worth a conversation. Um, Talking about meals, rooms, and alcohol tax. I mean, we dedicated that to uh, infrastructure development. I think um, this certainly counts. So that would be interesting. But especially uh, the one Rosie brought up, the um, the surcharge uh, for homes that sell for more than five hundred thousand dollars. And if it's really four hundred, you know, whatever the right price is, I think that's that's fine. Those. I, I mean, I, I think those would be, that would be a lot to talk about. And, you know, I, I don't know if we want to try to do, it would try to focus on one of them. I mean, it probably makes sense to try to just like do one at a time. Um, but I just want you to know that I'm, I'm certainly open to, to those. Great. Um, Eileen, did you have something you want to say? Yes. So should I try to talk into this? Is it working now? Or should yeah, I just talk loudly? Yeah, really yeah, really close. Or you can, you can take it out of the stand. Yeah. All right, just um, two quick comments. Um, first of all, I also really introduce want yourself. to thank you all. What a great presentation, overview of the history of the trust fund and just you know what it's accomplished and where it's going. So thank you for that great presentation. Um, but two things I want to highlight, and, and Jen mentioned um, the issue of getting community investment in projects. So um, we've had some great success in the past few years, um, and you know there's a lot of factors that play into it, but in no small part was the fact that the city was able to utilize the funds from the trust fund to you know, get French Block to happen. Those kind of projects, it's an incredibly competitive environment. The needs are you know, nationally, all over the state, um, so it makes a huge difference having that money available when the time comes to try to do a project like the French Block. So, um, critical funding to have that trust fund, and, and Montpelier has done a great job. And there are not, a, we're, you know, we. That's I get to highlight that when I'm, when I'm asking for money and support. And the other thing I really wanted to highlight is the first time home buyer program. It's super popular. We administer the program, but the quote that that uh, um, Holly shared just really speaks to it. And I'm not sure, you know, how aware everyone is of the. Um, college debt and child care crisis that young families are facing today, it is a huge issue. Um, um, we are now sort of talking, um, I've been speaking to Northfield Savings Bank and the state treasurer about this, that we feel like this could be the next housing crisis coming our way because young families just cannot afford um, home ownership. And you saw the quote from the 
from the Harvard group that um, it's a national problem. So having that little extra bit, that $7,500 or whatever we decide um, it's going to be, makes a huge difference. So um, I really support the recommendation that the task force made for the $150,000. And I think given the history, you can really feel confident that it will be well spent. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Also, that was I mean. <laughs> but you know. You know. Okay. I'll make a comment, Steve Whitaker. Uh, I'd like to just tie a thread together. I've asked that the Commission Council consider put, devoting some real time to broadband planning and its connection. But here's the connection is that the affordability of housing is directly tied to your other expenses. And if people are going to, in Montpelier, are going to spend $100 a month extracted by Comcast and taken out of state, our broadband plan can provide, in circumstances like Downstreet, one building can be fed with a gigabit circuit, and it might cost $10 a month to the tenants living there. So there's, there's planning that you need to be engaged with that can bring the cost of this housing down in more ways than one. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Laura Gephardt. I'm the Executive Director of the Montpelier Development Corporation. Uh, so I just wanted to come and speak in support of the Housing Task Force um, and their request tonight. Um, I do want to highlight um, from the great presentation, very thorough presentation and memo that um, they provided, that the vacancy rate is across the board. So we're feeling this tightness in the housing market at all levels of income. Um, and I think it's so wonderful and we're very um, fortunate to have affordable housing advocates um, like Downstreet and the people who sit on the housing task force. Um, but I do want to bring attention to um, a large majority of the folks who work in Montpelier that still cannot afford to live here or are barely able to afford to live here. Um, and it just highlights a really challenging situation that market rate housing is really difficult to build um, from a private standpoint. Um, so I'm, I'm encouraged by the continued conversations coming out of the Housing Task Force, and I look forward to being part of those a little bit more um, and just bringing um, some perspective from the business community as well um, and some of the challenges that they're facing and attracting future talent. Um, how do we do so for the talent that wants to live in proximity to where they work um, and for the talent that wants to be living in a, an engaged com community like Montpelier. Um, so I just want to keep have you keep that in mind um, as you consider their requests as well. Um, the Housing Task Force serves a whole host of um, housing needs um, in this community. Thank you, Laura. Other comments? Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for your time. Thanks for taking the time. Okay, moving on to the proposed parking garage structural design update. And I, uh, do I understand correctly that you are projecting something also? Yeah. I going to try. Okay, good. <laughs> but by way of backup, I'm going to give you my first of the slides. Print it out just in case something. Thanks. Is that what you already got? Yes. Is that what you already got? Thank you. I'm going to put this image up and leave it up. There are other images in the package, and I'll use those if people have questions. When, uh, when last we met with the, with the council, uh, we talked about the form of the garage, the way in which the circulation worked, and the council made a selection to go with a uh, switchback or single helical style of garage. Uh, we got a lot of great input from the community. Um, yeah, if we can full screen that. Um, 
regarding the design of the uh, cladding of this garage, and we've been focusing in the last week on, on that issue as well as a couple of uh, critical permit uh, issues. The image that's put up here is um, a view uh, sort of from about 80 feet in the air looking, uh, looking to the west over the garage towards the uh, proposed Hampton Inn. The gray box you can kind of see in the background uh, is the uh, existing Capitol Plaza. On the far left-hand side of the screen, you can see just a, a small piece of the one Taylor Street project. And uh, close by, it's a little difficult to discern separate from the Capitol Plaza is the mass of the proposed apartment building that uh, Christ Church may at some point do. Um, the big change here, I think, in terms of the floor planning, one thing that I do want to point out is that after hearing from the public and, and working on this, this proposal shows a ground floor that is more or less level. And the, the idea behind that is twofold. One is it helps us advance our, uh, our um, design issues with the, uh, uh, with the floodplain managers. But it also uh, creates some additional utility to this structure that could allow for alternative uses of this ground floor if, if a policy ever evolved to, uh, to make that possible. And I think it's, it's, um, it's an answer to people who had hoped for the whole building to have flat floors, but it's, it's also sort of strategically in the best possible place because it, it can act as a continuation of the Haney lot, which, as I understand it, will continue to host the uh, uh, at least a portion of the farmer's market. And so there's a possibility of some creative crossover there. Um, so the other thing about creating a, a level ground floor is it allows us to more closely design the structure to comply with uh, Section 2101E of the uh, Unified Development Regulations, which is essentially, uh, I'm not sure it really applies in this case, but it's a good guideline to go of go by in terms of articulating the structure in, in more interesting ways. Um, so as you look at it, one of the things we've changed is we've, we've alternated the pattern of solid and uh, green wall systems in order to more closely conform with the regs. Any one bay of material is going to be about 42 feet long. None of them are longer than that. Um, so what you get is you get a solid spaced with a, uh, uh, a green piece, with another solid, with a green piece. And from a distance, what that will do is give the impression of a collection of smaller buildings and hopefully it goes a long ways towards um, uh, making it so that it's not, uh, it doesn't read as one big building. Um, also, as you look at the corner of the structure here where the masonry is, you see a sort of clear delineation of the uh, bottom, uh, a strong band at the top of the first floor, a sort of shaft. And then, a, and then a strong cornice at the top. This is also a reflection of the, uh, of the LDRs, the, the Unified Development Regs in Montpelier. Um, and so we wanted to address that specific concern that was raised. Um, you can also see that we've, we've provided uh, a lot more glass into the stair towers, so you can kind of see the stairs switching back and forth inside the stair tower. Um, and lastly, we've created places, uh, as you can see, about halfway down the uh, south side there where the, there's that big arch, which would be a granite wall. And above that, we're showing uh, gallery panels for some pretty significant public art. Um, those are paintings I like. They're not necessarily, you know, I think what, what, I, what I'm hopeful of is, though, that, uh, is that um, a public process could begin to sort of start thinking about what that art might be, a, a great way to um, to bring the, the uh, citizens of the city back, you know, sort of into the process in a more creative way. Um, but we also, since this is going to be this side of the building, the south side of the garage is going to be facing Confluence Park, the new Confluence Park, it sort of creates an, a more interesting and uh, more lively backdrop to that public event. Um, and I'm going to try to do this if I can. Oh boy. <laughs> This is not my computer, so I'm not quite sure. Ah, here we go. Um, I'm going to pop up exterior elevations. There we go. Oh, can I open the other one?
sorry about this. This is not my computer. Um, yeah, okay. Computers never misbehaves. No, I'm just not that clever when it comes to these things. I just want to maximize the, the image. So here you see it in elevation form, and I think that makes it uh, a much more clear case as far as the alternating patterns of masonry and green growy stuff uh, with, the, uh, with the gallery panels and the big stone arch sort of centered on the facade facing south. You're seeing the obverse view of that, which is the, uh, the side facing State Street. Uh, a little more closed in for a portion of that, but that's, that's where we would overlap with a proposed future um, apartment building at Christ Church. Just try. Is the dark space open? Yeah, it's, it, it, those are openings. I'm not sure why that one particular came off as dark, um, but all those large rectangular openings, I, I still am advocating for a sort of sculptural effect inside those portals. Um, and, you know, we'll work that out in more detail as we go through the Design Advisory Committee and the Development Review Board. Um, but that was an idea that evolved during the first iteration of this garage, and I. I'm not ready to give it up because I think it's got a potential to be kind of interesting and exciting way to, to handle that. But um, what this what this facade does do is it does allow us to have enough open space in the garage that we don't have to mechanically ventilate it, and it also uh, goes a long ways towards uh, addressing flood issues. And in principally, I think it's it's a much better fit with the uh, with the unified development regulations as they're now written. So. When cars are in there, you won't see straight through, though, right? So where you have those angular Well, they, cor they correspond with openings on the other side of the building. Right, but in between, there's cars, so you oh, yeah, see cars, right? There would be stuff inside the garage, yeah. Um, and I'm sorry. I just want to bring up the civil site plan. This is a, uh, an image of the footprint showing some key features. The civil engineering drawings are, are under development. I, I bring this up to uh, point out uh, we're maintaining a drive, driveway access to the adjacent property. You can also see it, uh, uh, I don't know if I can use a cursor. Uh, yeah. So you can see in this area here where we're showing a secondary means of exit from the garage and also access to this adjacent property owner. Um, there is a 20-foot setback from the top of the bank in this district. The plan as presented now is com complies with that. Um, but the, uh, the property line kind of cuts right through here, so um, we, we have set the corner of the building to comply with that regulation, even though there's an intervening property owner. Um, one other thing I want to bring up, since it was a very important part of our discussion last time, was, uh, hang on a minute. Um, uh, I don't know if I can figure out how to do this. Well, there are multiple sheets in this, I believe. So I need to go to sheet. Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to close this one. What I'm looking for here is F, F11. I want to go back to this and find C5. Um, please bear with me. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know if I'm seeing it. Anyhow, in the in your application packages. Uh, there were uh, utility drawings showing our uh, accommodations to the people at Christ Church. I think there was some concern that because the display materials at our last meeting didn't include that, that there was some diminution of our commitment to making that work. And I just want to re reiterate that uh, we have made plans in the design of these two properties to address stormwater concerns raised by the folks at Christ Church and vetted by their independent engineers. Um, I know that's continuing concern to the church folks, so I'm going to continue to bring it up. Um, and I just want to... I 
This is a more um, more a drawing of the original um, the original subdivision, uh, the original plan as approved. In case anybody wanted to see that, so. This shows the relationship of the top of the garage, the uh, parapet at the uh, high point, uh, as, it, as it addresses the uh, Hampton Inn next door. Um, so you can see that the top of the garage extends up to about the floor level of the fourth floor of the garage, except for this little bit of a tower here on the, uh, on the end, which is, is as tall as it is because there's an elevator inside there that needs to go to the top level. And um, so, um, I know that that also shows pretty well. Uh, da, 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 da. So can I ask a question about yes. that drawing? Um, that makes it look like there really isn't a pedestrian walkway between the garage and the Hampton Inn. Has that changed now to the other side? Or is there still intended to be a there will be walkway a, there? There will be a, uh, if, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do things at once. There will be a 10-foot space between those buildings with an imaginary property line between them at a five feet off of each, each structure. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the illustrations are sort of uh, artistic conception. It doesn't show that space as wide as it should be, but I think, I don't know why that is, but um, the working drawings show that space. Uh, we are still contemplating some kind of pedestrian access via the Haney lot to the rear portion of the site. And, and those details will emerge as we go through development review. Um, this, this view in particular was, was created to help show that relationship with the overlap of the garage. If, even though they're close together, uh, that overlap is fairly short uh, because this portion of the hotel is narrower than the rest of the building. So from here on down to the, to the remaining corner, uh, that's all open. And in the latest version of this, we've included some green screen facing westward towards the, sta the Taylor Street uh, entrance of the project. And this also shows the degree to which the facade is, is notched out. There's a fairly significant break in plane there, and then the, uh, the individual planes are sort of going back and forth um, as well. So. Uh, Lots of improvements in the in the sort of fine grain detailing of the of the garage has has uh, um, been our primary focus since we last met with you. The engineering drawings are proceeding apace, and uh, a major application package will be submitted to the city tomorrow morning, reflecting these changes. Uh, in a, with any comments that members of the council and the public may may have this evening. So that's a broad overview, and then I'd like to set myself up with questions if I could. Okay, thank you. All right, Jack, go ahead. While we have this uh, picture on, um, is, is there, uh, am I seeing a wall uh, on the ground there, sort of, uh, if, if they, at the left of the picture, we have the uh, railroad tracks, and yep. then parallel to that, over to the right a little bit, it looks like a wall. Is that like a retaining the, wall. what it is? Yeah. Because the grade is higher at the uh, parking garage level? What we are proposing is the project site will drop in volume by about four feet. Um, that's going to do several things for us. It's going to allow the south wall of the garage to be remained open for flood flows. It also sort of takes the balance of this site and kind of puts it all down at the Haney lot level uh, so that the pedestrian features can work together. And um, most importantly, uh, that's volume that we need for the floodplain management to work in this part of town. I think I, I, everybody should know, as I mentioned at the last hearing, our goal here is when this project is done to have no net increase in the amount of, in the loss or no loss volume of storage capacity relative to flooding. And so what you're seeing is, is yeah, that we would drop grade in and around the building to expose more of it, to open up the ground floor facade, to provide for those flood flows and to create a volume of storage that compensates for the balance of the development. Okay, thanks. So I want to, oh, um, uh, you go ahead. <laughs> sorry, I think this is going to be a, a, a quick one. Um, on the same drawing, I'm curious about uh, 
just how the green walls work. This is something that uh, was pointed out to me after the last uh, presentation, that, that the green walls in these renderings don't go all the way to the ground. So it looks like they must be uh, rooted in planter structures or something like that, especially on that, uh, what would that be, the, the east wall? Um, well, I don't you, know if you if know you, this off the top you, of your if head. If you look at the south side, you'll see that the, those do come down to grade. Um, yeah. The uh, ideally, these will be planted in, na in 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 soil around the building, and they'll yeah. train up to grow on it. Uh, this north side, uh, the rendering was a little quick, but I think what what we what we haven't illustrated yet is there's there needs to be a green buffer at the bottom of that wall uh -huh. for for those things to be planted in. They can grow up the security grate that we have below on that side of the building. Uh, I think in the hurry to get the rendering out today, sure. though, we just we stopped landscaping at like three o'clock. Sure, sure. To print. But but the idea is generally that they would be rooted in the in the ground. So uh, yes, okay. yeah. And we're, these are these would not be. Uh, there are some living wall systems where there are like little buckets of soil and and watering systems and things. Those are generally. That's not what we're trying to do here. Okay. What we're doing is kind of a robust trellis. And uh, we're looking for more native plants to grow from ground level up. up Sorry, are you talking that. about this portion as well yes. right here? Yeah. I, I guess I'm, uh, I'm a little worried about that because I, there is part of me that likes the option of having that be open um, and just be, like visually having it be sort of a part of that. Anyway, I just want to express <laughs> okay. it. I have mixed feelings about that. I wonder, uh, Rosie, yeah. so I, I think the reason I'm like you maybe like the idea of it being open is that um, potentially you know farmers market could move under there on a rainy day or right. that kind of you know it kind of maybe has some interesting um, like you're talking about with the flat floor and so then if there's not a way to get in there if it's all covered with vines um, then that precludes that option and I'm wondering just about like can we have one section of it be some sort of interesting wrought iron gate or something that could be opened up and then the rest of it is vines sure i uh you know and i think those are the kinds of things that we'll sort out as we go through the design review process um, pedestrian accesses will be facing state street mm -hmm. both both up adjacent to the hotel and also down at the other end of the project site here on the east end um, early on in the project when we started talking about the parking garage uh, amongst the various city departments we talked to was also the police department and uh, you know one of the things we want to do in terms of a safety thing is sort of sort of have control over entrance and egress uh, so that um, you know uh, people can use the garage in confidence and they you know it, it, it just creates a more secure environment to sort of control where people come and go from but yeah I, I, I don't think the entire length of that green screen has to have soil underneath it for it to take off, but we have to have significant enough beds mm -hmm. that they can get up there. Once they climb up the building, they'll spread wherever they can. So, and b before you go down, I just want to jump on that. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, police review because that's something that I'd also come up in conversation um, after the last presentation, which is making sure that you know the the police have had adequate. Uh, you know, time to review and um, and give their input into what they think is safe. Oh, we, we've met with them on several occasions. Okay. Great. Uh, in service of the original project. Okay. I think that the, the values of the issues that we talked about then will remain in place. We are talking about some form of video surveillance inside yep. the garage and around its perimeter. Um, and we, I also mentioned uh, the availability of emergency phones or, yep. or uh, intercoms on each level. Okay, and thank they you. They have looked at these drawings and the fire department have looked at these drawings once and they will look at them again. Okay, great, Part thank you. design review. Uh, Donna. Just, I have two or three points. One, I'm really impressed that you took all the suggestions, there's so many, and came <laughs> out with something that looks really reasonable. Uh, I actually like that arch where you put it and the art above it. I don't like that you kept the towers flat, but <laughs> uh, so maybe they could be an arch too. Okay. Uh, but also the conversation you were having about the opening, one of the pictures you gave us last time in the smaller packet that had the right. cover letter, it showed the rooted plants like every car length. So it wasn't the whole thing, but instead of being totally open, there would be like two different root sets coming down. So you still had room for cars and people. So this right. makes it more feasible to have I'll it pretty open but yet still closed. I'll incorporate that thinking into the east elevation as we move forward. 
Also, I want to come back to Glenn. I feel like I interrupted you. Did you have any anything else? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I just want to add a couple things. I love that you have an archway in there. And you know, coming back to Glenn's comment the last meeting, um, I like that it is. It seems structural. <laughs> Right? At least is that. I like the archway too. It looks okay. great. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> I have a question. Um, this, this right here, th there's some kind of barrier there, right? Yeah. If, okay. If we look <laughs> at the drawings, you'll see there's a uh, sort of a wrought iron fence that's okay. about seven feet tall around the ground floor on the back sides. Okay. Um, I love the windows uh, in the stairwells and uh, up at the top of the parapets there. And uh, I, I think the art is great and I like that there's more like sort of detailed moldings. I think that's really nice. Um, it's just, it's, it, it says like it's, it's an interesting building. Like I'm, I really like it. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Um, other comments? Uh, Rosie. I had a couple. Um, I'm uh, a little bit worried. So this retaining wall on the railroad track is a new thing, right? It is. Okay. Well, there. I, I, let me back up and say, throughout the process of the original Hampton Inn project and the original gar to garage design, uh, there were always walls in the backs of these buildings. But this, this approach, this sort of carving into the land is new. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure we're really thoughtful about making sure that that doesn't impede pedestrian access to the park and that we do have good access points in spite of that wall. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, maybe it's, there's some, and I think there are opportunities, but I want to make sure we don't forget that. <laughs> Can I comment on that? Yeah. I'm a, I was actually sort of glad to the see end. that there was a wall there because I think technically people can't cross railroads anyway. Yes. Right. So this actually right. impedes. So we put them where the we want them to cross the road. Yeah. Okay. And that yeah. that feels okay to me. Anyway, sorry. Continue. Um, and then so we are supposed to have a an ADA accessible access to the bike path, and I'm very confused now about where that's going. Yeah. Um, I don't have a I don't have a finished drawing illustrating exactly how that's going to work yet, uh, but it's a, it's it's an issue that's arisen out of this whole stormwater thing. So we're working on that. Uh, the bike path, sort of this little triangle of green space you see here by the arch, um, just about where it says type here to search is where the bike path kind of comes around. And we'll have to ramp up to that somehow um, because, because we need to solve this volume problem. So is the thinking now that that just that comes through the Heaney lot? I'm sorry? That comes through the Heaney lot? That's the thinking now? Uh, yes, I, I think we, based on the opportunity and the suggestion that's brought up, I think that it's sort of a both-and situation. I think we'll want to continue to have some kind of access from the hotel to that, and I think uh, we also want to provide a similar facility coming through the Haney line. Okay. Uh, even if it ends up just being green stripes on the pavement, uh, we, we do want to make those connections back through. Um, and then the last question I have is about lighting, um, and we didn't talk about that at all last time, okay. but I want to make sure that we're really thoughtful about that because I think that can really make the difference in how safe people feel and also in how the whole building fits in around to the, the, um, the buildings around it. So um, I don't know if you've got thoughts on that already or if I that's a, to be decided. And I was just going to try to find a... Uh... So that's... One thing we've been talking about right along is we want to use LED lighting everywhere we can um, because we would like to be able to sort of get this to a status of net zero in terms of energy use. Um, this would be the typical ceiling mounted light. It's, it's pretty big in diameter, but we've got this kind of curvy theme happening in the elevations. I, I guess I'm thinking more about exterior lighting. So um, Okay, and then I show that because it comes with a... I don't think that's going to be the right one. Okay, here we go. It corresponds to a matching uh, sight light, so that the lights on the top of the structure uh, would be this. Out along the driveways and stuff, we're, we're, uh, previous approvals showed a more traditional uh, gas light looking fixture with an LED gut with LED guts, and so for the the surface driving areas in through the hotel project and stuff, we're going to continue that. But inside the garage, not the top floor of the garage, you'd see something like this. And are these ones that'll reduce the 
uh, light pollution, it'll just be directed downward? They're and... full cutoff fixtures, okay. and, uh, and they're also um, uh, completely LED, so very energy efficient and dark sky, uh, uh, they'll meet the dark sky requirement for this, for this type of zone. Okay, great. Great, um, Ashley. Did we ever resolve the issues that Christchurch raised at the last meeting? Well, I think it was a concern, mostly born out of the, the sense that they maybe hadn't, they were looking at new drawings and they weren't seeing our earlier conversations reflected. Um, and that's why I, uh, I was trying to bring my copy of uh, C5, which I know I have printed out large scale. I don't see it on the thumb drive, unfortunately. Uh, but um, our engineering package has always included, um, I'm just going to hold this up for, for people. This is the civil engineering drawing C5 from the hotel project. And it shows the improvements that were proposed to make the Christchurch people whole, which included uh, careful grading analysis, uh, some kind of drop inlet structure and a, and a pathway to get to the main sewer system and some secondary yard drainage just to protect the uh, memorial garden from flooding. Um, our engineers worked through that, designed it, and then uh, the church had uh, engineering ventures of, South, of Burlington review and comment on the original design and changes were made. So uh, all, all of the output of that process remains in place. Um, and I, I think just because you were seeing preliminary drawings, they didn't have every catch basin drawn on it. Um, but I, but I, th those those items are still defined in our work and will still be a part of this. Um, as far as the setback issue goes, I think that's something we'll take up at the development review board level. Um, but we are maintaining a green buffer space on the north side of the garage. It may not be exactly what the previous iteration of the application showed, but it is still a a, a major concession in a no setback district. Um, I. I, th I think there's ample opportunity for them to continue their plans to develop their property in a, in a, in a way that will work with this project. And, uh, you know, we continue, when we do visual analysis and stuff, we continue to show their, their building as a placeholder. I don't know if they'll ever get happy, but I can say that we've, we've kept our commitments thus far, and we haven't been, um, we haven't retreated from any of the major elements that were necessary for this to work for them. Yeah, if I can just add to that, Ashley, we've met with them several times and we continue to meet with them and we've taken the MOU that they had made a lot of progress with the Besheras and we're working through those issues on eight out of 10 of them. We're in complete agreement and we continue to work on the couple that we're just still working on. But we meet with them regularly. Great, thank you. Donna. Well, in our packet last week, we had the C4, but we didn't have the C5. Could you get us what? Hey, Donna, final can you speak into your? Yes, thank, thank you. you. It's on this side. We have C4 in our packet from last week, but we don't have C5, okay. and that would show us more clearly what you're talking about as the church potential housing sit sitting. Can you get that to us, or the latest revision of, of it? Course. Of course, of course. That would be helpful. Um, and, and bear in mind, C5 is in the public record already. It's part of the record drawings. So it would be in the, the website? Well, it would, be in the, it would be in the packages for the original uh, Hampton Inn and Suites application and approvals. Yeah, um, but I don't but, have uh, But I'm happy to resubmit it as part of this application. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Yeah, I, I don't know why it didn't end up on the thumb drive. I guess that's, that's me in a hurry to get out of the office. <laughs> So uh, I just want to check in. Any further comments from counselors, and then we'll go to the public. Yeah. Sorry, just one more. Um, so there aren't windows in the midsection on this one. There aren't windows here. Right. Is there? What's the reason for that? Oh, that was me being architecty, I guess. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, let me. Uh, because the elevator's on the other side, right? So that's not... Yeah, it's on the opposite corner of the building, right. So, um, she's, she's referring to this blank section of wall here. And it was... Okay, it, I don't, I don't have a strong feeling. Some, I just was... It was meant to I'll, put some ground space between this big panel of windows and this sculptural element yeah, here. The open space, I think, more defensive. It's fine. <laughs> 
it's okay, Rosie. You can... <laughs> There's a bit of texture there that you can't see in the, you know, in, in an LED projector. That uh, is the, the part of that masonry forms columns on the corners and then there's a little oh, nice. bit of a recess there oh, okay and right. there's some interesting bonding going on in the brick too we're showing a Flemish bond which is a little more interesting hmm. um, so we've done some things here that don't that aren't readable but that was that was intended to to sort of space those two elements out great okay further questions from counselors great. okay any comments from the public Barbara uh, <laughs> Are you walking forward to comment? <laughs> it's, two turns already. it's okay. Um, Steve Whitaker, chief critic. <laughs> uh, we continue to cut corners here. Uh, I learned today that the driving force causing these corners to be cut is this supposedly secret document, a threat from Hilton to withdraw the franchise if we don't start building if Bashar doesn't start building this year. Uh, I'm told that's not available to the public. In my frame of reference, anybody who's asking for public assistance, which Bashar is doing, is required to disclose some of their privacy details. A document proving that Hilton is not willing to extend this franchise into next year should be demanded by the council. Uh, otherwise, we're cutting corners for no good reason at all. So if I may comment on that, I mean, we work with White and Burke, and they're a third party, and so they've been a, a great a great go-between for us. Let's carry on. I'm still asking for the proper response. If somebody's going to claim it exempt or even give me a redacted version, maybe the numbers of the lease fees, license fees are redacted, but the threat to cancel the franchise, I'd like to see that in writing. Um, a casualty of this among many that I'm talking to, is faith and trust in government. If we're barreling along, it seems like the council and some business leaders have made up their mind and, you know, we're going to duck and run like if this was Kavanaugh uh, and y'all were Republicans. So <laughs> they take that for what it's worth. Uh, the garage economics are absolutely flawed. We applied into a TIF plan for this district and I have confirmed that the cost of maintenance of the green wall are not factored in. The air conditioned room for the servers, the video equipment is not factored in. Uh, there's a lot of, the expenses of running this garage could be two to three or four or five times what they've been estimated at. So, and as I understand it, the Bashar agreement is structured so he's got a fixed cost, which means the overage of operations and maintenance. Last week, my brother was here from Santa Monica, and they have six of these garages in Santa Monica. And the cost, the necessity from all the brake dust and the rubbed off tire rubber uh, chokes any plants, and they require a weekly or bi-weekly power washing. Those costs are not built into our, into our estimates here, our maintenance costs. Um, Similarly, I heard about the maintenance of the drains, the drains and filter system for the stormwater. Uh, getting some real numbers of the cost of that maintenance and the frequency of it is essential. Uh, the renderings, they really misrepresent what here. This, this is new that we're going to have a, a fortress wall, whereas last week we were going to have exit from the garage out to the park. And now we're told that you're not going to have an exit out of the back of the garage to go to the park. You're going to hit a retaining wall. Um, th this doesn't show the railroad bridge. The railroad bridge extends uh, 20, 40 feet into where this footprint is. I just walked over there during your meeting and walked over to measure, to pace off the 20 feet. It's literally 19 or 20 feet to the river at this corner. But we're moving too fast. We don't have our economics right. We don't have our planning right. We're trying to design aesthetics by committee, and it's just reckless. Um, there's no traffic study. I'm told that by our assistant city manager that we've contracted for one now. But those take a considerable amount of time to do when prior parking studies that I've looked at uh, indicate two or three turnovers a day. 
And if we have 300 spaces that are going to turn over two or three hundred times, two or three times, we've got 1,200 cars a day coming in and out of this driveway. That's not going to be a quick traffic study. Um, I understand that state employees stay longer and hotel or off clock. Conflict with prior plans. We have a Montpelier 2030 sustainability design charrette that came out with a great vision. And true, it hasn't been a fully adopted by the powers that be, but it runs directly in conflict with this size of a building and this location. So you're basically going to saddle and preclude a, a real confluence park. The, 20, the 2000 Riverfront Park talked about not putting the parking up against the river and open space and performance space. And you're going to foreclose those opportunities if you just keep Maryland down this road. Um, we need to get our alternative, our rail and satellite parking plans done first before we determine whether we really have a need for this big of a parking structure at this location. Uh, many people come to Montpelier because they like Montpelier the way it is, not because they want to park in a garage to get to the stores. Uh, you know, street parking is part of the charm of Montpelier. And I think the biggest risk is that the traffic created by this is going to necessitate turning the Haney lot into a street and putting a stoplight out at Elm because we didn't factor in that this uh, driveway from Taylor to the Northfield Savings Banks cannot handle the load of traffic. So I think I'm happy to elaborate at another time, but I think I've made myself loud and clear. Thank you, Steve. Other comments from the public? Okay, thank you. We're gonna, we're gonna move on. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. So, yeah. If I, if yeah. I may, I'm mm -hmm. actually, I'm, I'm looking at the public records rules uh, in the state law in Title I, and where there is a public-private partnership, and there's some benefit derived by a governmental entity, it kind of does seem like that agreement might actually be subject to disclosure. If ha Have we received a request at all for that or for the, agree for the development agreement because the city is gonna be using TIF to create this? Sorry, the, the uh, agreement between the Hilt, uh, Hilton and the Becheras? Well, I think, I mean, so the, the only way that's going to happen is if the parking garage happens, right? Is that mm -hmm. right? correct? Right. That is correct. So, yeah. so I, to... I think that it sort of almost by default becomes part of a government project because the only way it's going to happen is if the government acts. So, I mean, I think it's something that we can talk with Whitenberg about and shares and we'll go from there I mean it it just it just strikes me that if the if the the representation has been and I have, I have no reason to doubt that it's just it seems like if that's one of the questions that is being asked like it, it, I would just say that it's a city garage it's built by the city it's owned by the city it's paid for by the city the Bashirs will be leasing 200 spaces at the same rate that pretty much everybody else will be renting them at uh, for 30 years so it's not quite as clear-cut perhaps as Stephen makes it sound no and I, I'm not saying that it is clear-cut but it, it seems that there would be a, at least a colorable argument that you could make and I know that you know, the way that our statutes are drafted and there's not much case law on the FOIA sort of like how this works with public private partnerships. And I know it's an ongoing issue where we're contracting and subcontracting state business or other governmental services. Um, but it, it does seem as though it may be something that is subject to disclosure, at least in part where uh, particularly maybe the part with regard to, well, if this doesn't happen, then by this date, then this won't happen. I think it's worth asking. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Any other further comments? Okay. 
Great. So we are moving on to thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there will be other, just so, actually, well, as we are moving on, there will be other further opportunities for the public to weigh in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, you know, at design review meetings, There will be at least two design advisory committee meetings, two development review meetings, at a minimum, by legal requirement. Yeah. And there may be more if, okay. if people raise substantive issues. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so moving on to the Parklet Ordinate Amendments. Um, so we uh, have... We've got Parks Commission. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Why did I... I think the Parks just like so blended patiently my sitting head. There. I apologize. <laughs> Two-minute two break? Okay, two-minute break, and then we'll jump in with the Parks Commission. That's great. Okay, so we are up to the Parks Commission, so um, we want to welcome the Parks Commission up to the front here. Um, and I know, Rosie, you have um, done a lot of thinking and work around this, so I may turn this over to oh. you Hang if on. you're... My agenda open. Okay. No, no rush. <laughs> So I think that um, we had had a lot of miscommunication with the Parks Commission and didn't, you know, we thought we were communicating to you and maybe you thought you were communicating to us and we set some goals around parks and maybe you have some goals that we don't know about. And so um, we had a really great tour, a bunch of us, I think not the whole council, um, had a nice tour a month ago um, of Hubbard Park and then um, also some other spots around the city um, and that was a really great start to kind of uh, hear where um, you're focusing some of your efforts so we just kind of wanted to invite you here today to open up some of the lines of communication um, hear what your thoughts are how we can best communicate with you and how you'd like to communicate with us um, we have a couple um, potential new ideas and projects coming down the pike on our um, uh, consent agenda tonight was the purchase of a, a new piece of land and I know that some of the preliminary thoughts on that were parts of that might be park land and so wanting to get you involved in that early on um, and one of the council's goals that we had set this year was um, to uh, get a park on the, the south side of the river the other side of the river um, and so when we had that tour we started talking a little bit um, about that um, so this is sort of meant to be an open conversation and love to hear your feedback and what your thoughts are and um, just kind of start that conversation. Great. Well, thanks for having us. I guess I'll go ahead and start us out, um, but I'll introduce myself. I think most of you know me, or at least have seen me at this point, but I'm Dan Dickerson. And I'm, on oh. um, I'm Dan Dickerson, and I'm a member of the Parks Commission, and I'll go ahead and have um, these two introduce themselves before I go on. So my name is Fabienne Patterson. Is this one? <laughs> my name is Fabienne Patterson. I'm also uh, a um, commissioner. And Bill Johnson, also on the commission. Um, so I, I just want to say, you know, thanks a lot for having us. I think you know, this is a great opportunity to open a dialogue that, you know, frankly has been missing at least in, in the few years that I've, well, I don't even think it's that yet. Uh, the time, the limited time that I've been on the commission, there hasn't been much dialogue between the commission and the city council aside from, and I want to thank uh, Councilwoman Bate. She's actually taken a lot of her time to attend our meetings and, and she has provided some sort of valuable, I guess, city council person perspective to us, which has been really helpful. Um, but I, I think I want to um, I want to lead it off by saying that you know we we in fits and starts we've sort of tried to take some initiative on you know coming up with you know a strategic plan um, that builds on um, what what is already contained within the green print. Um, so we have this parks green print document that basically. You know, it's it's really looking more towards expansion of the parks um, and a creation of, of recreation trails, but it also sort of touches on you know preserving existing spaces, but not in a tremendous amount of detail. And I think what 
what I would like to do, and I think what other commissioners like to do, would, would be, you know, in the vein of what the city council does, is says, you know, here are goals for this year, how they correspond with, you know, the broader goals of our, our green print, you know, what the cost is or, or what we need to put together for resources, the staff time in order to do these things, and then sort of key our budget off that, you know, I mean, our budget currently is, is really sort of an ugly spreadsheet that shows, you know, salaries, FICA, health insurance, equipment. Um, so it'd be really great, I think, for us and for, you know, you and the residents of Montpelier to see, you know, our, our vision for a given year that shows these are the projects that we want to accomplish and, you know, here's the cost. This will be a part of our greater budget and, you know, so people can envision that, wow, you know, they're going to improve um, uh, the Gateway Park or they're going to, you know, redo a trail in Hubbard Park. Um, and so that's, I won't say that we've gotten there yet, but that's sort of what we want to work on. And I think, I think our, our FY20 budget request will, will sort of have some of that spirit. I think going into the following year, I think we really want to, to take this process forward and, and hopefully it will, what we want will align with the city council. That would be very helpful. <laughs> um, but I, th I do think that, um, you know, it would be nice to hear more from you about, you know, what you want. You know, obviously, I mean, as an elected body, we have some autonomy, but in the end, you know, you control the purse strings, um, you write the ordinances, so we're, you know, to some extent, we're subservient to, to what you really want. And hopefully we can all agree and, and you know, communicate those things. But um, I sort of wanted to, I guess, lay out the reality. Um, and, but, we, you know, I would like to hear more about what you're envisioning. And, you know, I, I'm, we can certainly have a conversation about it, you know, amongst ourselves when we have our meetings. Sorry, I'm not looking at you have to speak into the mic. It's too hard. So uh, I just wanted to say I'm so so glad you're here. I'm glad that we're having this conversation, um, you know, especially with having goals that overlap. I think it uh, makes sense that we're here, and in fact, it seems a little overdue. You know, one of the things that I thought was interesting from uh, the the uh, memo that we got um, for, that included some uh, language from our lawyer. I found it really helpful to think of the Parks Commission sort of in the same way that people um, might think about the the school board, um, that it is a separately elected, you know, body that has this jurisdiction and um, and that it's in, in a certain sense like kind of parallel. Um, and that, that was just a, a helpful framework for me. Um, but I, I think because you know, because we are the sort of the financial body, uh, um, you know, having uh, closer interactions or more s even like scheduled interactions, I think makes sense. I mean, one of the things that I'm hoping to do with our next goals setting session, which would probably be roughly next April, um, would be... Uh, you know, so, well, let me back up. Um, this last April, we included department heads um, as a part of the conversation of setting goals. But I, I think it also makes sense to uh, include um, not only you all, you know, in our goal setting process, but uh, other committees as well. Um, and, and not that other committees are the same sort of standings, but but g just getting um, just all the stakeholders in the room, you know, having all the, the interests represented and, you know, knowing, uh, actually going to that planning commission meeting where uh, so many different groups were there to say what their goals were. That was so enlightening. And I, I wish that we had done that sooner. So other thoughts, comments? Yeah. So th I guess there were a few key areas that um, I'd like to at least start the conversation on tonight. Um, one of them is the areas of responsibility. You know, what what are you going to do and what are we going to do, especially in terms of developing these new parks? Um, and then um, I think there's been some confusion about who oversees the park staff. Um, and so that might be just a, an area for us to clarify. Um, if you feel that the Parks Commission is currently directing the park staff. There's some confusion about who's 
giving them priorities. And um, so we should clarify that because it's certainly going to be confusing from their end if they're hearing from different bosses and also confusing if they're not hearing from any bosses. So, <laughs> um, so talking about that um, and then as we've kind of alluded to those goals and priorities, which it sounds like that should be a longer term conversation um, when we do goal setting and um, when, when you have um, come up with that strategic plan. So I don't know if any of those sound Sure, I can, I can take a stab at, at that. Um, so I, I think to respond to your first question, which dealt with you know these, the responsibilities of the Parks Commission as opposed to, or not as opposed to, but, um, and then the responsibilities of the City Council. So using Confluence Park as an example, um, you know, there's a piece of land, the city owns it, um, you know, in, in my eyes, and I think you know, in, in Paul Giuliani's eyes, um, the Parks Commission can't say, this is park. You know, that's that's up to you, and that's what you did a few meetings ago. Um, although, I, you know, it'd still be nice to see sort of what the ultimate boundaries of the park will be, but I doubt that will happen until the, the building's there and the bike path is there. Um, but then, you know, the way I see it, and I think the way his email sees it is from that point on, you know, once you've declared this space a park, it falls under our responsibility to to construct the park, um, to maintain the park, and control the park. Um, and so, you know, like I said before, you hold the purse strings. So there's not a whole lot we can do without the money. But you know, on on paper and in in the um, in the charter, that those responsibilities for for maintenance and upkeep fall to us. And and that's what we would happily do because it's you know it's a really exciting space to have a new park. Um, I think on your on your second question, um, as far as staffing, you know, we, we had a conversation about that. We actually just had a special meeting last night to sort of set budget priorities. But, um, you know, the, the way the way it was laid out to us from park staff and, you know, I, I mean, I fully agree is, you know, they're ultimately they fall under, you know, Bill Frazier and, and Sue Allen's control. So they're, you know, I mean, if we tell them to do something, there's there's so far they can go before they have to say, you know, no, we, we value our jobs. And so then it fall, you know, if, if it's something that, you know, is directly conflicting, you know, a, a priority for us, then it's up to the Parks Commission as an elected body to really push back to Bill Frazier or to the city council or, or Sue to say, you know, this is really what we want. Um, you know, and, and then we would have that conversation, you know, diplomatically, of course. Um, but I, you know, I think that's the way I see it. I don't, hopefully you agree. Um, so it sounds like what you're proposing is that, um, or the practice is that you would be communicating with Bill about what your priorities are and then having him communicate further to park staff about accomplishing those. Is that? Um, I think, I think really, it, it, primarily, yeah, Jeff and Alec, communicate with Bill uh, you know when it comes to the budget process we we work with them to to figure out what funding we want and then you know Jeff takes that to you know to the the staff meeting that they have within City Hall I don't know what that entails but we've we've never or at least to my knowledge we've never been a part of that process I don't know that you know I would I would want to I feel like that's sort of an administrative action that you know we probably should insert ourselves into but you know if yeah, you know, just continuing on the on the budget subject, you know, if, if we really wanted money for something um, and and Bill Frazier wasn't willing to to give the funding for that or at least propose the funding to that to the city council, then I think, you know, we would have the power to, to come to the city council and say, hey, we really want this. This is the reason why. And, and you know, lay out our our cause. And, you know, it's still ultimately up to you to make the decision um, that would go on the, the city ballot. But. Um, and I realized I missed another thing on here was communication, which we've kind of alluded to a little bit. But um, how would you prefer? I mean, we've done these kind of letters back and forth occasionally, and I, that feels not the most productive. <laughs> so um, I might want to set some, you know, what? How would you like us to communicate with you, and how should? You communicate with us and one of the, one of the things as we just actually talked about yesterday um 
to, um, to increase communication and we would like to actually increase our visibility and our presence and our connection with everyone so that um, as the projects develop, they would be, it would be a lot easier to develop them jointly. Um, we would be more um, involved with you guys, I think, so that the whole process, I think, being, um, it would be clearer and I think easier. And so if we're more visible, I mean, that means includes like to the public, we were talking about our website, we talked about, you know, just to, so people know, continue to educate people to, so that they know who we are and how that works. So it's kind of like a work in progress. <laughs> Um, Bill Johnson, I, I, I do have something. I think we just need to communicate to better. Uh, up until now, there, there really has been uh, very little communication between the, the council and, and the commission. Uh, an example would be when you set your goals for parks, we weren't part of that discussion. And, and I think that that has to change, personally. Uh, somehow, we need to be at the table when issues having to do with the management and, and, and uh, maintenance of the parks are, are at issue. And that really hasn't been the case. And, and I, I've actually talked to a couple of you about it. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad we have this opportunity today to, to talk about it and, and hopefully work toward this. Uh, we could have liaisons to talk back and forth. I think primarily we, we, we do need to, to deal with because the other part of, of the puzzle that ha we haven't talked about too much is is the manager's position and then the manager has a considerable amount of power in in the, the city and uh, we just need the, com the communication not to be just between the council and the commission but also the manager's office and there there has to be some sort of flow now exactly how do we accomplish that I'm not saying that I have any tremendous idea uh, other than uh, if it's a park issue let us know we, we would be happy to talk with with, with uh, Sue and Bill and and, uh, and or you uh, and we can move forward from there uh, it is a sort of an awkward position as, as people on the council have mentioned uh, and it, it's the result of uh, what John Hubbard wanted uh, he, he this is what uh, it can be changed, but uh, that's what uh, he put in his bequest, and, and that's where we're at right now. Uh, so at least until an ordinance changes uh, that, that uh, changes our relationship, uh, we just need to communicate better. So uh, if I may jump in there. So we, uh, you know, we, we did just talk about goals and, and having you uh, be a part of our, our goals um, setting uh, schedule, really. Um, and I, I wonder if that schedule aligns with your goal setting schedule. Like, I don't know when roughly you, like if that would align. Um, because if you had goals that you wanted to accomplish, I, I mean, I want you to feel free to say like, here are the things that we would like to do. Um, and then, I mean, our, our goal setting and, uh, and then our budget is, is often a little funny, right? Because we set goals in April for the year, but then, uh, you know, some uh, like kicking in in July is the next fiscal year, right? So, um, and even now, uh, like in November, we're going to be starting to talk about uh, budgeting for goals that we haven't even really made yet, which is a little weird. Um, so that's that's sort of, sort of an inherent um, quirk of uh, of our system but that seems like the other area of overlap right is is the budget and so I mean I could picture like if you all had um, I mean you're you're tasked with like the control and maintenance of of the parks and there's a third thing which I can't remember off the top of my head but um, but in any case uh, if uh, with any of those things you know I mean I'm sure um, you know Jeff and Alec come up with a, a budget but if there are other things that you want it in I'm sure probably they they consult you on that as well um, but uh, if you wanted to be a, a like if we wanted to set that off um, you know, to highlight it, right, that this is coming from a really like a, a separate body. Um, you know, I wouldn't mind calling it out as, a, as its own thing. 
um, and giving you all a chance to, to speak specifically at, during our budget session. Um, I mean, what, what do you think about that there, Rosie? Maybe? Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're all just, we're spitballing this right now. <laughs> like, so, um, I mean, it's, uh, if, if Jeff and Alec, if that sounds okay or interesting to you, great. If not, like, let's keep talking about it. But um, I think especially since, you know, we want to honor that, that, you know, you, you all, that, that this, you have a specific charge and, and the overlap there is with the budget that, that, that feels like a way to, to honor, you, you know, that, that parallel entity-ness. <laughs> yeah. The other thing I've been thinking about is, you know, since Donna has been going to some of your meetings, I wonder if we should actually um, appoint a council representative or a council liaison um, to kind of be your point of contact on the council um, so that if you have an item that you want to draw our attention to, you have some, rather than trying to contact all of us, you've got one person that you know you can have an, you know, go to and have an informal discussion with or who you can ask to come to your meetings or that kind of thing. I, I don't know if that makes sense to others. Well, as this conversation was going on, one of the things I was struck by was that we have a whole lot of boards and commissions and committees in the city, and most of them we have council members appointed to serve on those uh, boards and commissions. And uh, for institutional reasons, you know, the council could not appoint somebody to be on the Parks Commission, but it certainly leaves a gap, an institutional gap in terms of communication and everything else. And so I, I think formalizing it by appointing a liaison would be a useful thing. I, I think that's something that we would certainly be amenable to, and you know we would be happy to do the same so that we have a point person for you. Um, you know, when, when issues come up dealing with the parks. I, I know, you know, a few meetings ago when I was here and, and I think we were talking about um, canines, but, you know, the, which hopefully that won't go any further tonight. But, um, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, the, I think several counselors, you know, stated that they were getting emails with with complaints about you know canine issues that were that were potentially happening in the park. So I, I can't recall the the conversation precisely, and that really concerned me because we weren't getting those communications. And and I think to some extent, you know, maybe I think we do need to put ourselves out there more and make it clear that you know when there are issues in the parks, um, please contact the parks commission so that the city residents know that. But I think also, you know, having a liaison from the Parks Commission that you as city councilors can contact when issues come up, I, I think would be really helpful. And I think we could certainly do that. And uh, we would happy, we would happily have a representative from the city council, you know, attend our meetings or, you know, just stay in touch with us to let us know what's going on. So what you're saying is that if we get emails, complaints about canine issues in the, in the parks forward. in the parks in the parks <laughs> in the parks so we will forward them yes to you. okay yes we we okay. do want to know those things that. Yeah. because i mean but actually yeah you know and i and i guess i'll i'll beat a dead horse a little bit more although talking about canines is eating up so much of our time but you know i i think um on this issue specifically i mean we we really haven't gotten much you know negative feedback on on the continued you know, freedom that people have to walk their dogs off leash. And so from in our eyes, you know, it's in, you know, we weren't, we weren't trying to sort of contradict what the city council's concerns were. It was really, you know, we're not getting communications that, that people are having issues. So yes, if, if you get, you know, canine complaints or cat complaints or bear complaints in the parks, please, please let us know and, and we'll do what we, what we can to solve it. And, Thank you, you know, so much. Jeff and Alec work hard in the parks every day and, and, you know, we'll help and they'll help and we'll, we'll come to resolution. Out. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Connor. And then I would love to, I think we're wrapping this up. It seems like, yeah. No, I, I was hoping to get the party started here <laughs> and, uh, wonder yeah, if right. it's <laughs> appropriate to make a motion to, uh, appoint Donna as the liaison, not member of the parks commission. How do you second? Oh, yeah, is there a second? I would second that. Okay. How do you feel about that, Donna? <laughs> okay. Uh, and you all are okay with that. Okay, great. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> And I, I had one final thing that I just wanted to know if it was on your radar. Um, I noted the, that Morse Farm is no longer doing cross-country skiing this winter, which is very sad. Um, but I am expecting that that's going to increase the cross-country ski pressure on the parks trails that are maintained for that. And so I'm just hoping, and I, this is a hope for me, but I don't know if others feel that, um, that you're thinking about that and thinking how you're going to manage that. Um, yeah, I, one of us brought that up at... at I don't think it was this. I don't think it was yesterday, but it was the, a couple weeks ago. But you know, yeah, that's. I think we're going to have a, a an in depth conversation about you know where can we improve our our capacity, um, and you know whether it, whether it requires you know, improving some trails to make it you know gentler for cross country skiing or whatnot. But but yeah, I, we're definitely going to have that conversation because it. I mean, it saddened me to read that rat article that you know I can no longer ski there. Um, but it's it's on our radar. Great. Anybody else? Anybody from the public? And we, we'll keep you posted. Okay. Well, let's we know. will communicate with you. you. Communicate. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. We look forward to it. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. And now we're on to uh, the park that ordinance, as I was mistakenly jumping to earlier. So uh, this is. Uh, an amendment to an existing ordinance. And um, one possibility is that we can sort of look at it section by section. Another possibility is that if, if counselors have specific um, concerns or objections, uh, you know, we can just go right to those sections and then uh, we'll take comments from the public. Um, so I guess my inclination would be to say, well, uh, let me just back up and say, I'm gonna assume that you all read it. <laughs> That's thing number one. Thing number two um, is, uh, does anybody have specific concerns, suggestions, changes they want to make? You know, whatever. It's all good. Yes, Ashley. I guess the only thing that stood out to me uh, in the revised draft uh, is on, I can't tell if it's page, yes, it's page three. Um, it is in the second to last full paragraph uh, and the strike through or may was substituted with and otherwise must be open to the general public. Um, the only thing I fear that that may trigger some additional insurance liabilities or other things. I don't think that any of the parklets are closed at all, but if it's a city requirement and something happens in a parklet, Mm. It just seems like there may be, I don't practice that kind of law for a good reason, <laughs> but uh, it just seems like something that may be problematic. We do require an, an, a fairly large insurance uh, certificate. It's somewhere else in here. It's like a million dollars or something. That's, that's fair. Maybe they'd have to build that into... You know, there's whatever statements they have going to their insurance company, though. And the other question, I'm assuming that the expectation is that the businesses will assume the cost of the signage in that same paragraph. I think, I mean, just speaking for myself, I think probably both of those things are reasonable as long as we just tell the people up front that, like, we expect you to include this in your insurance. It's probably not going to be lots more, I guess. And uh, and that they have to include a sign. I mean, they're going to be if they're building a new park. That anyway, they've got to. How does that signage stuff factor in with the zoning requirements? Because they thought there couldn't be any signs, any permanent signs affixed. The planning department, Audra, does walk over and go through signs with uh, the parklet owners, and they have to pass certain standards to be used. Right, well, but this is now requiring, they, these, sh these signs shall be there. They so would have to comply. But if, uh, what I, I think though, I guess what I'm saying is though, I, my recollection, although I haven't looked at it recently, is that there was a prohibition on permanent signage on parklets. We didn't do that, we talked about doing it and I was voted down, so there's no prohibition on. <laughs> 
<laughs> I remember because I lost that one. <laughs> I too, and everybody didn't want to get into the language of it. And yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So we didn't do it. Okay. Good question, though. Glenn. Um, while we're in that paragraph, I have uh, a little language quirk. Um, uh, the second sentence, parklets may only be restricted to use by patrons of a particular establishment and so on. Uh, I would move that only so that it says parklets may be restricted to use by patrons of a particular only during their operating hours. Does that make sense to people? Parklets may be restricted to use to use by patrons of a particular establishment or group of carpeting business only during their operating hours. Because that's what the only refers to, I believe. Um, Fine with me. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. And there was something else. Uh, Could you get on your mic a little bit, a little more? Oh yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I've already forgotten what the other thing was. So pass on. Okay. Other thoughts? Did you open the public hearing? That's oh, what it was. Thank That's you. Was. <laughs> I forgot this is a public hearing. Um, I'll, we'll officially open this as a, a public hearing. I mean, we'll take comments from the public shortly. So, but yes, officially open. Thank you. Forgot that part. Any other comments from counselors at this point? Go ahead, Jack. Well, one question I have is that uh, there's one parklet that is not developed pursuant to this ordinance and I just think we need to at some point determine what exactly the legal status is does do they have a permit for a fixed period of time just all of that so that once we do this everyone's on the same footing mm -hmm. so just to clarify my understanding is that uh, they are grandfathered in, like their permit was for three years, and so once that runs out, they'll have to, if they wanted to keep it, they'd have to reapply under I these rules. I think we hit three years, though. Sorry? Well, um, pie? Yes. Uh, has it been three years for positive pie? So th if they, would, they might have to. Year three, I it's think. been three. It's been, okay. so, so they're, they're in, the, in, the bu in the bucket with everyone else. Right, yes, I think that's true. Unless I'm wrong, and then <laughs> someone can tell me that I'm wrong later. But I think that's that's true. But I'm thinking of uh, you know the one on Langdon Street, obviously more than two spots, right? So that one's uh, going to be harder to modify. But three years, you know, will and then we'll they'll have to you know comply with this. Do you have something? Go ahead. Mike Miller, Planning Director. So I have the your sign answer is uh, the following signs do not require zoning permits. This is 3012D. Uh, public signs or notices erected or required by the city or state within the public right away. So if we require you to put up a sign on the parklet, that would be a public notice required by the city within the right of way. So it would be an exempt sign okay. under zone. Great. Thank you. Okay, other comments? Public. Good evening, Richard Shear. Uh, everyone on council knows that my wife owns a downtown business. Many of you watching on Oregon know same. Um, I'll just come to the question basically of the parklet itself and its role in the street and the commerce that goes on that street. Uh, we just got out of an extensive <laughs> session on parking, on public parking, and this is parking as well, uh, parking for gone. And the real question becomes, is the council choosing winners and losers? And now, my wife has gone through this with this council, the council before, and the council before that on the question of parklets, and she's finally come around to some degree to say that the parklet when the city has ample other parking, that the parklet really does exist and can, it can coexist with the, the neighboring merchants. But the premise of the parking garage was a parking survey that showed that parking on the street, particularly State Street, was parked out during the day. 
it was maxed out. Those two parking spaces would be used by customers, perhaps a positive pie, perhaps some other businesses. They do have a meaning. If you talk about the parklet in May, that's fine. June, that's fine. July, that's fine. August, that's 13 weeks before you start to need that parking when leaf season starts. What she doesn't understand and I don't understand is why one business should have proximate parking to their project during the entire of leaf season when all of the businesses need that parking. Now, were she here tonight, she would say, let's make this a summer project and take it down after Labor Day. Now, one of you on council, who I will not reveal, had said, let's compromise this to October 1st, which is halfway through leaf season. One business can have those two parking spaces exclusively for the first half of leaf season. The other 22 businesses can have those parking spaces for the second half of leaf season. Realizing that after October 1st, very few people are sitting in that because weather is not conducive to sitting outside. And let's not forget that both of those parklets, not one of them, but both of them, have sidewalk dining. It's not as if if you took this away, they would all of a sudden not be able to treat their customers to the outdoor experience. So what I'm saying is about a month ago, maybe a month and some change, she wrote to you about the question of the end date. I didn't hear any of you in a discussion of the end date. Uh, two things. One is the business community's opinion taken seriously on this. That's the first. And then second, can you guys state a reason why October 1st wouldn't be a good time to bring those things down and go back to full parking for the second part of leaf season? Is there a coherent reason why those things have to stay up when the weather is down in the 40s and 50s? I'll, I'll listen. I'll take mine off the air. I'll take it. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I guess I would just um, advocate that um, should the weather be nice, I mean, the more opportunities to sit outside, I think the better. Um, I think it is weather dependent and, you know, for sure, if the weather is, you know, uh, unpleasant enough that people don't want to be sitting outside October 1st, then fair enough. Um, my uh, understanding was, um, too, that, you know, we want to give people as much time uh, for that uh, as possible. And um, anyway, I'm, I'm open to discussion about it. Um, but yeah, Jack. I think outdoor seating for businesses is a good thing when business, when weather permits. Uh, you may have noticed in the draft ordinance that we did cut back three weeks on the uh, <clears throat> on, on the time limit. It may not be everything you're uh, looking for. It clearly isn't. But um, I think people are torn between saying, "Well, we need the parking," plus and on the other hand saying we sometimes get really nice weather into October that uh, enables people to enjoy being outside if, uh, if we do. And so I, I think this is a compromise. Um, Leaf season is over really officially by um, the hang time on, you end it. Hang on, uh, no. Richard. Sorry, I'm going to let Sorry. Jack finish. Yep. I, I'm certainly aware and appreciative of that as a concern. I don't think we've heard from what you refer to as the business community on, uh, on what we should do. We are going to have another public hearing on this. And I certainly welcome uh, other views on this question because I don't think that there's anything magic about November 8th or October 15th or any other particular date we might pick. Uh, Glenn, then Ashley, then Donna. I think Ashley was first. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I actually am not opposed to October 1st. That's five months. May 1st to October 1st is five months. Uh, that leaves the remaining seven months of the year. Um, 
you know, I know that at least in my time on the council so far, there was a lot of business community opposition to having uh, the down-home parklet on uh, Langdon Street. And so it seems to me, and it seems to me that October 1st is, is, is reasonable. I mean, you know, if the goal here is to meet everyone's needs in town, um, you know, it'd be taking off five weeks, but it would still be five months. Um, and it, it just seems to me that that's actually a pretty reasonable compromise in terms of meeting the needs of other businesses um, and and being mindful of the value that I think parklets do actually add to our downtown. I frequent them regularly. Um, so I, I, I'm actually okay with October 1st, and I'm happy to make a motion that we move it to October 1st. Is there a second? I was, but she just made a motion. So I think I've been swayed. I'll second. Okay, so we're going to have some further discussion. Um, and in that, we're going to go to the other people. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm happy to say that I was, uh, I think, the person Richard was talking about earlier. Um, <laughs> that went unrevealed. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, but... Um, I, I'm not sure that, uh, despite having suggested that we might consider moving it to October 1st, I'm not sure that I am completely in favor of that. I don't think it's a bad idea. Um, at the same time, uh, I want to point out that uh, it was interesting the way you framed it, uh, that um, parklets are for the, or that is parking spaces are for the 22 businesses, for example, or for the one. Uh, and they're also for the people who want to park there, regardless of whether they're visiting those businesses or just parking and, and walking somewhere else. And uh, speaking just personally, as someone who never drives, um, all parking spaces in town are nearly useless to me unless there's a parklet in them and I can sit there and have dinner. <laughs> so. Uh, that's not to say that I, I think we should get rid of all parking spaces now, but I do want to point out that, that there are more stakeholders here than just the immediately uh, adjacent business and then the rest of the businesses along the street. Um, I'm also an employee of a storefront business, and we definitely have lots of customers who like to park right in front of our store, so I do see that as a, a, a valid concern. Uh, Tana, and then I, I've got a well, comment. I couldn't resist. I printed up uh, Cinder's email this August 14th, and I did respond. I you didn't did. agree with her, but I did respond. <laughs> um, and the piece, reason I didn't agree and don't support the motion is that it's for pedestrians. It's giving, we keep saying we want more people on the street. And I actually, because we had it, I think, closing before November. But I saw so many families use the parklets, both the ones from the restaurants and the pocket park, during Halloween. It was great seeing them congregate, looking through their suites. Um, and when the weather is good, you see people using it in the shops, even though it's chilly out. So I prefer to keep it till November, but that's just me. Uh, that's, uh, that's interesting, and um, I think you're both touching on the point that I wanted to make, which. Um, it was interesting to set up like the dichotomy between, you know, is the parklet for one business or for, um, you know, for their their benefit of, uh, you know, of their restaurant, let's say, uh, versus parking for the remainder of the businesses that are in the area, and uh, for parking. But I I guess I would also see that even if the parklet is there as a as a park, that that serves the other businesses as well, right? Like retaining people downtown, having them uh, hang out on the street might actually uh, be another reason for people to come downtown and actually spend more time in those other businesses. Like it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily feel like a deck, like it's either this or that. I think they can both be beneficial. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think in response to one of Glenn's points though, it's parklets for those businesses 
serve the people who can afford to eat there, you know, and, and there are a lot of people in our community who can't. Um, and there are a lot of people in our community who do drive to work on the weekends who, you know, need places to park. It's open parking on the weekends and they can't park there. So just, uh, you know, I, it is a, it is a balancing um, but, but to me, it's about meeting everyone's needs and doing that in a way that seems equitable. You know, I know that we're not going to please everyone. That is unfortunately one of the hard lessons that I had to learn on council over the years. But, uh, you know, it just seems as though we can strike a balance. And I, I think that the October 1st, you know, change up is, is kind of reasonable. And, you know, it, it, it gives five months of being outside uh, there are still places to be outside in downtown Montpelier. I was just looking at the October 2018 weather predictions and, you know, a balmy 26 degrees on October 7th at night doesn't really seem like the kind of time I'd want to be hanging out outside. Um, so I just, I'd just like to counter that. Uh, Rosie? So I don't really have a strong opinion here because the only uh, stakeholder we've heard from on this is the Corgi Pet. And so I, I understand where you're coming from. You've got a, a, a good case to make. Um, I would assume that other businesses have opinions and I don't know what they are. Um, so I would welcome uh, additional comments on this from uh, the additional stakeholders um, at the second hearing. Um, I guess I'm willing to go along with it this time with the understanding that if, if people feel really strongly about a different date that I would hope that they would come out next time and um, we could potentially reconsider it then if we hear a strong opposition. Jack? You, you mentioned you got to something that I was just about to ask you in your role as parliamentarian, which is if we, <sighs> if we pass this motion tonight would we be able to reverse that action at the second public hearing of the same ordinance? Yes, you can edit it. You can change it. That's why you have the second hearing. I think so, too. <laughs> Even with the exact same motion? Okay. Yes. John is saying as far as he knows, so. <laughs> We've done it in the past. We have a second hearing. It's not for nothing. You do it to take input and make a final decision. I mean, the other thought I had was could you table it until the next meeting. But I would say please don't no, table it, but no. I have to go to the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> okay. Table it, wouldn't that devoid your first hearing? No, you'd just be postponed. Motion to postpone. Good to postpone it to the next. But that's fine. That's we can just point. vote. In. in a hearing? I didn't think we could do it in a hearing. It's still under front of it. Okay. Great. Oh, good. Uh, I'm not sure I'm following all the language, but uh, it. I think it makes sense to me that uh, since this is the first time we have discussed in council the idea of moving it to October 1st, and it would be useful to have other people's opinions. Uh, I would think that we should keep it at October 1st for now and plan to, oh, I'm mean, sorry, October 15th, excuse me. Keep it at October 15th for now and uh, solicit other opinions for the second hearing and, and reading and, and change it then if it seems recommended. Um, that's my inclination as well. Uh, I, w I would have a vote right now, but Ashley's not here, <laughs> and that seems unfair. Yeah. So um, one possibility is that we can stall for her. Another possibility <laughs> is um, any other comments from the public? Any response? Okay. Okay. Well, I have one other thing yeah. to say while Ashley's out of the room, because uh, uh, this whole discussion about who gets to use the parklets, who, who benefits from them, that both Glenn and Ashley have raised really gets back to uh, the interest that Rosie's made over the years, which is non-commercial parklets are of, of real value. Um, one further note, if we do change the date this meeting or, or next or ever, um, we should just also adjust the cost because it's a, uh, it's a cost that's uh, linked to the time. It wouldn't be in effective this year, but that's not fair to people. Oh, no. You mean like right now? Yeah, no. Yeah. No, no. this it, year, but next year. I, and actually, that's a good point. I wonder if we have to build in 
Because if we vote on this next time, it could... There's an appeal period after we change... Oh, yeah, it doesn't like go into effect immediately anyway. It's like 10 days. days or something. Sound right? Yeah. So, but, I mean, one possibility is... Uh, and so this has an, uh, has an enacted... Oh, that, so the enacted date was the original one. We might just want a s forward date, like, when it's going to be enacted. So it's clearly not this season. Can we make that? Or effective date. Or, yeah, yeah, an effective date. That's, I think, a better word for it, yeah. Um, can we make a note of that for next time, Sue? I, I mean, is that okay, team? I know I didn't really make that a motion, but. Uh, Donna, do you have something? Are you proposing also that we set them in the second hearing for the third? Or for the 10th? Oh, I would suggest the 10th. Good. I'll be back. Okay. Okay, so Ashley, we didn't vote while you were away. Um, <laughs> we'll see if she does that for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would hope to do that for everybody. Uh, okay, so uh, we have a motion on the table to move it to October 1st. Um, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 How many was that? Okay. Um, uh, all opposed? Nay. 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 So how, oh my gosh. Oh, I think I it's see. four and you weren't setting the hearing. Okay, four and two. I think it's four. Was it not clear? Nay. I'm yeah, sorry. I I thought. Yeah, I guessed up. Okay, so I think it's three and three. Three and you three. Have to vote. So I got to vote. This is the first time I've had a chance <laughs> <laughs> anything since becoming mayor. Just saying. Um, and then the mayor votes nay. So, um, which is to which is also to say, like, if businesses are unhappy with October fifteenth. Um, but gladly welcome more feedback um, on that. So, to be continued. Yeah, I'm not opposed to that as a hard line, but just would want more feedback. Yeah. I would have equally happily voted yes on a motion to table because I, I, and I'd be happy to be persuaded to change my mind next time. Yep. Likewise. Okay. Great. Thank you. And and you do make a good point. And for me, it is also weather related. So anyway. By the 10th, you should have a pretty good idea <laughs> of what it feels like there in the late afternoon. Yeah, that's a good point. This year is going to be that's cold. Next year could be like the year before. Um, thank you. Okay, yep, thank you. So uh, let, we're going to close the public hearing, and uh, we need to set the date for the next um, hearing, uh, the second reading. Do you need a motion for that? I think we do. Uh, I would move to close... I don't think we need a motion oh. to close the hearing. I would move to set the uh, date of the second hearing for October 10th. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, building and zoning permitting report. I love your charts. You like the charts? Is that guy going? Well, we're getting logged in here um, for a what's hopefully going to be the shortest PowerPoint you'll ever get. <laughs> uh, I'm Mike Miller. I'm the planning director. Sorry, I got back up. So, Mike, if I can just ask a little bit about the context for this. Mm -hmm. um, this is really to just be an update about how we are progressing towards EDSP goals. Is that, or is there a different understanding that you have? <laughs> I was asked to give a presentation on permits to update the council on. Okay. Um, Who asked for this? <laughs> this says, intended outcomes of E. Yes. To ensure economic development, Mike, there's pressure here. Sure, it happens. All right. So let me go through real quick. The Feel free to make it quick. It's okay. I'll make it quick. Yeah, I know. We can, we can look at our instruments. To be, um, the so I just have a handful of slides here to just go through. So what I put together a couple of summary charts of what's going on with permits. So to be able to compare apples to apples, we just queried our permit software and looked at permits issued between January and September of each of these years from 2014 to 2018. 
and as you can see the number of permits hasn't changed much either for building permits in red or zoning permits in orange really kind of has stayed relatively flat which kind of surprised us a little bit because we have been extremely busy um, so what we kind of dug in a little bit and started to realize was that um, a lot of this came out of the complexity of the projects that we're seeing now um, uh, one permit for a fence, one permit for a garage, those are still one permit. But one permit for Caledonia Spirits, one permit for Taylor Street, one permit for a hotel offer considerable amounts more of work. So where that would show up is actually in the amount of fees because more com complex projects receive more reviews and generate more fees. So that's where the second table came in, which looks at by fiscal year because that's how it kind of runs through um, the system. Uh, FY15 through FY19, so we only have two months of FY19, which is why that's really small. But the, the red bars, again, are building, orange bars are zoning. The, the three years, FY15, 16, and 17, total $232,000. FY18 and two months of FY19 are 226000 So. And we have a $9,000 permit that we just added in. So in 15 months, the last 15 months, we've generated the same income as the previous three years combined. So it's, and the fees have not increased for building. So this is apples to apples. Um, the zoning permits, we did increase after FY16. So there was a jump, but I think that doesn't account for all of the increase that you see. So we are, we are really getting a lot more fees. Uh, FY18, we doubled the budgeted estimates. So we were supposed to get like 130,000 and we got 250,000 of combining them. So we're, we're definitely generating a lot more fees and I think that just comes back, that helps to show how busy staff are downstairs um, issuing permits. So the final graph was uh, start to look at you know, uh, performance. So uh, each one of the little bars going across represents a different project. The orange and the red, you'll see kind of moving across. Uh, those are the building permits uh, for either public buildings or single family dwellings. So they're moving across. Uh, a few years ago, we were generally issuing building permits in four to eight days. You'll notice that's starting to creep up. Um, building permits are now taking between 14 and 23 days to get issued. Um, and we'll get back to that um, in the last slide. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then um, the, the next bar, which you can barely see, are zoning administrative permits. So an administrative permit is something that doesn't need any reviews. It's a permitted use. I want to build a house. I want to build a shed. I want to build a fence. Those take one day. That's always our goal in our office, is if we have a permit that's complete and ready to go, we should be able to issue it within 24 hours. And that's what um, we strive to keep doing. Uh, the next bar, it's uh, kind of a greenish bar. Those are design review permits. Uh, the thing to note on this one is actually just look at 2017 and 2018. Uh, you see a big drop um, on those two green bars as it goes across. That's actually by design. We talked when we met with you um, to talk about the, the new zoning, we talked about we were going to build this new abbreviated zoning process where if you have a DRC permit, you don't have to go to the DRB. It used to be you'd go to the DRC, make your case, the DRC says this looks good, and then we would put it on a consent agenda item two weeks later to get on the DRB so the DRB could vote by consent to approve. Well, we just said if everybody agrees, we'll just say the zoning administrator can issue the permit. If you disagree with the DRC, then you'd go to the DRB. Well, that obviously made a big difference in the amount of time it takes to get a permit through the DRC because it dropped from 23 days to five days. So that's a little bit of good news there. The final bar, the blue bars, those are projects that had to go through DRB. Uh, and we actually had to truncate the tops of the first two bars in 2014 and 2015. When I got here in 2014, we had a lot of problems getting some decisions out. Um, in fact, it was uh, almost reaching six months to get decisions out. We made a, a number of uh, big structural changes and we brought that down to 40 to 30 days. There's, there's a certain amount of, you can't get much faster than that. 
Um, because you have a 15-day warning period, we have to go and review applications. So really, 30 days to 45 days is a target to shoot for. A lot of the delays of these permits also are not the fault of staff. Um, applicants many times are the reason it takes themselves longer to get applications approved at the DRB. They either don't put in full <laughs> applications, change applications, don't show up for hearings, and that would show up to push our time. So I, those times are actually quite good to be in about that 40, 35 to 40 day range. Um, so the final um, are just a couple of things going forward. So uh, if this was just going to be a little bit of an update on how things are going in the permitting world downstairs. Building permits, um, Chris Lumbra, who's a building inspector, he's doing an excellent job, um, but he's under a lot of pressure. He's got a lot of stuff that's going on. Uh, the timing of permits is starting to slow. So this is gonna be a little bit of policy question. Um, the delay, you know, what at what point is the delay unacceptable? I haven't heard complaints from builders, but it's worth keeping an ear out for. Um, but that that slip in time starts to, to build up, but it's not a result of anything other than the fact that just Chris is is swamped and he's doing the best that he can to keep keep things going. Um, Chief Gowans has gotten certified uh, within a couple of months, maybe a month or two ago. So he also can now do inspections, um, but he also has a full-time job. <laughs> but it, it will be helpful to have that. Um, when I talk to Chris about what his concerns are, um, trying to meet his obligations as a building inspector. His, his number one concern is actually for the extras. He would prefer to see some items like the health officer, junk ordinance, vacant building ordinance, these other ordinances that creep in and steal hours and, and days out of his schedule that he would rather be focusing on the building inspection role. But he also is the health officer and he also is a junk officer and he's also the vacant building officer. So. Those are the things that kind of come back. Um, my, you know, my job as as kind of uh, as director, I'm trying to keep an eye out for the short and the long term concerns. Um, if this development amount of development is going to continue into the future, we'll need to have some conversations about expanding the department to get an assistant. But um, we're kind of playing a lot of things by ear at this point, and we will we will see how. Chief Gowan's now being certified, how much does that help? And we're just going to really keep our ear out. We don't want to burn out Chris. He's a really good inspector, um, but it's, it's busy. So uh, regarding the zoning permits, um, we've made good progress improving permit times. We've increased our fees. Um, so uh, sometimes, uh, increase in times, the amount of time it takes us to kind of get things done are a little bit higher this year due to the new regulations and a new zoning administrator at the same time. So uh, it takes time to train people. Meredith is our third zoning administrator in four years. Um, I'm pretty good at training zoning administrators, but it still takes time. Um, uh, and she's doing a great job. She's a quick learner. Um, and the zoning fixes will help. Some of the delays that we have right now are just from the little things that kind of caught us. We were like, oh, we didn't think that was going to work that way. And we will get them to you soon, and you'll kind of see what we mean. Um, again, there is some potential need for office help downstairs um, when it comes to Audra's workload and Meredith's workload. Meredith is still part time. She's now four, she's four days, so it's better. To, it used to be when I originally was hired. One of the changes was uh, that helped to reduce those times was the fact that it was a half-time zoning administrator that we moved to three-quarter time, now 80%. So that's helped to improve those times. Um, but other things have also kind of come to a stop. The community rating system, E911, we really have not been doing a bunch of projects that we've been wanting to get to. Um, we're keeping up on the zoning at the expense of not being able to do some other projects. So it's just another thing to keep on the radar. It's not something I know there's a lot of departments with a lot of needs. And um, I'm more concerned with Chris's, but Chris's fees actually would pay for his own assistant. I mean, he has a department with an expense line of $85,000. He's now generating $210,000 in permit fees. For us to hire an assistant for him could literally come out of his own fees. Um, 
So the zoning permits less so. So we're, we're going to work on how we can reshuffle and try to make the zoning permits administration work a little better. But um, so that was all I had. Um, and I will take any questions. I've got a couple. Um, oh, cool. no, go ahead, Donna. You first. Okay. Um, so you pointed out the um, turnover in the zoning administrator. Do you think that has anything to do with it being a part-time position or just a circumstance? I think that was just circumstance in those. Um, I think anyone who met Sarah, who recently left this year, would know she was just a tremendous asset downstairs and lives in Waterbury and a job opened up in Stowe and her husband worked in Stowe and I don't think there was anything we could have done to have kept her here. Okay, so it's not, we don't need to make some alterations to the nope. position. Nope, okay. I've always been open to them as well, whether it was Sarah or whether it's Meredith to go and say, if you want more time, let me know. I would rather work with you and work with the council and work with Bill on making sure we have something that fits okay. them. And then is there, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if there's a way we can take advantage of the fact that, you know, we get the spike in fees and then, you know, some years is probably going to be less. And is there a way to move some of that to temp work or something so that when there is, when there are a lot of fees coming in and there's a lot of work to do, we can, you know, be really agile and bring somebody in for that time period, but not be kind of locked into having a permanent position there if that's not a permanent status and I don't know if you've done any thinking about that or we've talked you know uh, chief and I have talked a bit about different things whether we had um, people on the in the fire department who may have had time in, in trying to go and work things out we really just haven't found anything that was going to fit that it takes somebody who's got the training and experience um, he's you know has sort of certifications that need to be met in order to fulfill the role so so none of that office work could be for the zoning side yes that's a question that we've had and it's a little bit more recent um, that's kind of come up and I think this is a discussion of how important some of these other things are we can just move some of those e911 and things just wait for those to a different fiscal year and just let the staff concentrate on permits and that could kind of fix that I guess that, that that work crunch, assuming that next year is a little bit slower. <laughs> That's the thing is we just don't know we don't know what comes up down the line. I'm, I'm be, being successful, getting projects going in the downtown has its pluses and minuses, and one of them is being busy. My questions were very similar in about the part time zoning administrator, but also. There are other things you refer to that we're not doing besides 911 addresses. Um, so do you have a list? I mean, do you have a, a besides an inspector, an additional somebody to help out with that, do you have a, a list going on in your head of all the things you're pushing aside that besides? Uh, not, yeah, nothing that's been written down. It's been a lot of for, for the people who work on the projects day in and day out, or for the permits day in and day out, it really is first come, first serve. So as, the, as things are coming in this way, it's just a, you know, a conveyor belt working on these projects. So what happens when that line just never stops is that other pile that's over here that are the things that, you know, the E911s and the community rating systems that you just don't ever get your arm back into. But And your zoning administrator was being a staff person for the design Review committee, yes. Yep. Is that still true? Yes. Yeah. So uh, Meredith staffs the Historic Preservation Commission and the two uh, review boards, design review and development review. It's a part-time person. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, it's 30, 32 hours, but yes, she's I'm amazing. Okay. Very impressed. Further questions? This is actually, uh, this is very interesting. I mean, the, that graph of, uh, you know, the, the increased b uh, building fees coming in. It's, I mean, it's sort of, it's not surprising because it seems like that would be true, but it's just neat to see the numbers yeah. um, supporting that. So. And uh, it's it just, just to give you some ideas, um, the parking garage fees are not in there. Okay. And the wastewater treatment facility is not in there. So those are two fees that are in the six figures, probably. So 
the from fees? ourselves. The fees. And for even though it's our project? Is, even though it's our projects, those are... Well, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, the Some of it is the left hand paying the right hand in this one, but it's but it <laughs> but my department needs the resources to pay the people who do the, do all of the work. But just remind Chris that's our money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The the fees are not made out to Chris Lumbra. They are made out to the city of Montpelier. Oh, I want to see him pocketing. Oh, gosh. Oh, okay. okay. Well, yes. thank you. Um, okay. And if anyone ever has questions, um, you're more than welcome to get in touch with me at the planning office. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. And so we did skip the communication strategy thing for now. We'll come back to that. Um, so moving on to the VLCT municipal policy. And Ashley, you're our, our representative to the VLCT at the upcoming meeting, right? Here y'all may regret that. Oh, no, it's <laughs> fine. I know you wanted to talk about some of the um, details of this, so I'm going to turn yes. it over to you. Okay, so I have spent some time going through the uh, VLCT, um, basically their positions on a number of issues, uh, and I have so I've identified a list of probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight things, not probably eight things, a list of eight things uh, that displease me. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'd love to get some perspective because I think uh, I am going to be speaking for all of us. Uh, so what I would love to do, if it's okay with you, Mayor, is sort of run through my list. I know um, Jack had some things that he had identified as well. We may have actually identified the same thing. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, so what I was thinking is I would love to run through my list of things quickly, or maybe not so quickly. Um, but so let's see. So... Uh, section 3.02, uh, uh, item number 2 in that policy. 3.02. Could you mention the page numbers as you're doing this, uh, There are no policy. page numbers in the online 02. version. Okay. So, but it's uh, 3.02, Corrections, Mental Health, and Addiction. And uh, number 2, which uh, VLCT supports ensuring that offenders housed in community settings receive... Um, reasonable DOC supervision and access to support services that ensures the safety of the community. Uh, there have been a number of issues across the state uh, where offenders have actually been targets as well. Um, and so I, I think uh, it's our obligation as a community that works with uh, offenders and with victims and with community members uh, that we are mindful that it's safety concerns for everyone. Um, and so I had proposed um, uh, ensuring that or something along the lines of just either um, adding uh, victim and offender safety because both of those issues are things that come up routinely um, to that um, I realize that these are just things that Montpelier would be proposing and they would require uh, additional buy-in from other people but uh, I think that it's quite important um, when members are released into, you know, when offenders are released into our community, that we are a community that uh, does our best at welcoming members of our community who are committed to uh, living here and working here and making this their home uh, and being supportive in that. Jack? It's a, I have more of a process question, and uh, I could see this going either way. Um, we elected Ashley to do this and we could just say go do what you want or we could do something a little uh, kind of informal and just have her go through the list and get kind of a thumbs up thumbs down but the other thing that occurred to me was that she might want a more formal vote so she can say I went to my city council and we unanimously voted to take this so I be happy to hear what uh, what Ashley would like to do. Uh, I would love to be able to say, you know, the council voted on these proposed changes from Montpelier and, you know, they supported them or I, I don't think I would raise ones that the council didn't support. Um, but uh, some, to me, some of the policies, particularly around corrections, mental health and addiction are really problematic. Um, um, what uh, thoughts? 
What would you, be your preference be? Yeah. For your own comfort, that's great, but the group assumes you have our authority. When you're the delegated vote, that we give you the vote, you have it. So All right. it may well, will. strengthen your wording, <laughs> but I you mean, have I'm not, the power. I'm not confident that there are enough people that would agree with, with us about this anyway. So. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I would feel comfortable with that, but I, I think it also is stronger if we do vote. Do you want to just like tell us what the, yeah, the so let suggestions are? Yeah, so let me just read you then... my list. That, yeah. um, so again, the same section 3.02 number three, uh, adherence to mis municipal zoning and improving housing for offenders. I just want to make sure that everyone is clear that uh, all of the sociological research shows that uh, offenders fare far better in community release programs when they're actually integrated into uh, the sort of heart of the community and not sort of pushed outside. And I read that as saying uh, they basically want to keep offenders uh, sort of, it says lodged near the general population, and I don't think that the near the general population is appropriate. I read um, that. <coughs> it's funny, I read that meaning instead of being put out here, that they are part of the general population. So oh, is there a word okay. choice there you could put that um, are I just, part of the general population? I, I think we've... Located within the general population? Something along those lines. Yeah. Integrated in? Yeah, some, something like that. But um, all right. Sounds good. 302 <coughs> number seven, I want to ask for clarification and guidance because I'm, I'm not really sure what this even means. Collaborative solutions to handle incapacitated persons between all affected stakeholders. It's really unclear. Uh, and I'm not really sure what incapacitated, just it, it doesn't really seem to mean anything. Um, cool. And Support there's you. <laughs> uh, on three, Point zero seven number one, uh, I think that there is an inaccuracy. Sorry, I'm just opening it up. 307 number one, allowing a Vermont law enforcement officer to make an arrest based on a warrant from another state that actually happens. They're permitted to do that as long as it's an extraditable warrant and we can receive uh, that information. Uh, the prosecutors then receive that and file petitions. So uh, it's just not clear to me sort of what they're getting at there. That's already the status quo, uh, provided factors are met. So maybe clarifying that with them. Uh, again, 307 number three, uh, I believe that that law was, uh, well, uh, that regulation was changed, the Department of Health regulations that permit um, prosecution for uh, bath salts and synthetic and designer drugs, though uh, it's an ever evolving list. Um, so I, I just, there's like a whole process to changing those rules and it's not something that prosecutors and law enforcement do. It has to come from Department of Health. So I think that's an important <coughs> clarification to make. Um, 307 number four. So uh, marijuana has already been legalized. I know there was opposition to that from VLCT, I believe. Um, but I would propose that we, uh, I mean, it says in any discussion of marijuana legalization, well, legalization's already happened. Uh, so I would propose that in any, something along the lines of in any continued conversation about taxation and regulation uh, of marijuana or uh, something along those lines, um, identifying and addressing the impact on cities, towns, and villages, yada, yada, yada. Um, I just, it, it's already been legalized. So I, I don't know that as a, as a community, we want to support rehashing the legalization of. Is this last year's policy paper that they're just putting it? it it's, it's dated okay. 2018, 2019. Yeah. So, and I thought that too, but I, I double checked the dates and I was like, that's strange. <clears throat> so, uh, let's see. 404. I think, hold on, let me make sure I read this right. I like the rehashing comment. <laughs> oh, that was a good double entendre. I didn't even think about that. Uh, 404, number one. Um, so uh, support, so the, the statement is holding municipalities harmless from liability for any hazardous material incident at any facility that conforms with all state and federal permits and regulations. Um, 
I understand what they're trying to do there, but it just seems like if there's negligence on behalf of the municipality or something, I, I'm not willing, I don't think we should support indemnifying ourselves. Uh, ourselves when we're negligent. That just seems a little too self-serving for my comfort. Um, let's see. And my biggest issue, which is, I don't usually every issue is a big issue for a hill. Um, there is an entire section found in 407. Um, and so in, uh, in 4.07, uh, everything focuses on opiates, which really misses the mark in a significant kind of way. Uh, as your county drug prosecutor, I can tell you that we are seeing a huge resurgence of crack cocaine in the area. Um, we are seeing uh, prescription drug abuse, and I think that it's short-sighted for anyone to solely focus on opiates at this point. I think it's a larger conversation about addiction generally, uh, and I would propose that uh, that be changed, and I, I think um, Montpelier has a problem too, and, and it's not just opiates. Uh, so those were my sort of big issues. Oh, no, I, I agree with everything said. I had a couple as well. <laughs> um, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, no, actually, to be honest, this document kind of scares the hell out of me. Um, there's some real blanket statements yes. here that I worry. I, I worry that like Montpelier taxpayer dollars are going to pay for lobbyists to advocate I know. Uh, on positions that might be completely contrary to uh, what we believe in as a community here. So the biggest one for me is VLCT opposes all unfunded mandated programs. Uh, and there's a whole section on that. Um, and I think about what came up at the State House this past year. I'm talking about like increases to the minimum wage. I'm talking about paid family leave programs uh, that initially was intended to be uh, a shared cost between the employee and the employer. So if we are an employer, right, um, would we actually be lobbying against minimum wage increases or paid family leave? I believe in some cases we could, and I really respect a lot of the people who work at the league and I think they do a lot of good work in other areas. Uh, but I remember being in testimonies when we were looking at expending the coverage for, you know, firefighters who would uh, be entitled to a presumptive disability for different types of cancer. Yes, yes, absolutely. And while the league might not actually come out explicitly opposed to it, maybe they'd be bringing a witness from a smaller community who would talk about the impact this would have on their insurance rate. Uh, so this might be a larger conversation here, uh, but I really don't like our resources going towards lobbying efforts uh, such as these here. That said, oh. I have one little tweak on one of these. I, the, there was another big one that I had, uh, and I'm really glad that you said that. It, it's related tangentially. Um, in the 1.08 public records section, uh, churches uh, or religious purpose organizations uh, are exempted. And um, I think that if a religious organization is receiving dollars from governments of some type, that maybe they should be subject to the same requirements that uh, all the other recipients would be. That. Or, or if my alternative was, which no one would ever go for, uh, based on a constitutionally protected purpose, because there are many constitutionally protected purposes, but uh, I would just propose that we propose striking uh, that whole section, except those exempted based on a constitutionally protected religious purpose. I mean, I, I don't really want to be like proliferating um, I, so I have to tell you, my brain is starting to shut down because um, <laughs> it's getting late, and I apologize. Um, so I'm, I'm starting also, so Ashley had a series of suggestions. Um, Connor, I'm a little unclear as to like how much of the suggestions that you're proposing you would like Ashley to take with you. And I know, Jack, you probably had a short list as well. 
Um, so just to like make this clear, uh, before we get to kind of your suggestions, um, uh, I would actually love to have a motion on uh, whether or not we are in favor of Ashley's suggestions on the whole, if we feel like we're ready, we want to do that, or do you want to just say, go ahead, God bless, it's okay. If we already voted and gave her authority to represent us before. Sure, then maybe we don't need to. We don't, Fair enough. she wants it. Any objections to that? Would you prefer to be able to say at this meeting that you have the backing of the whole council? But you do. You you do. You I do. think I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Everybody knows seen. what I'm going to say. Okay. And I, I added Connor's piece. Okay. Uh, so yeah. that was clear uh, to you. Well, and you'll find more when you sit there in the discussion, let me tell and you. And <laughs> any any um, further discussion on Connor's I think piece of it? More. Or was there yeah, I things? just had one specific one to add. Okay. Uh, 2.06 rail, um, number five entails BLCT supports extending passenger rail service. To Burlington on the western side of the state by 2020. Um, in our strategic plan, we support a commuter rail up to Burlington from Montpelier. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest an amendment adding uh, VLCT supports a commuter, uh, creating a commuter rail service from central Vermont to Burlington. Great. I like it. Cool. That's it for me. Um, uh, Jack, you had something I thought, and then Rosie? I had one. Okay. Yeah, it's. It's funny, just as a general observation, it's a mixed bag because there's a lot of stuff in here that is well within the city's interest to support, like all the stuff about full funding of payment in lieu of taxes and stuff like that. Um, one of the things that really jumped out at me as I was reviewing this was 1.09 sub, sub 3 that says VLCT supports requiring the implementation of all state rules, regulations, criteria, and other administrative actions affecting local government operations 30 days after a publicly noticed hearing. And I don't fully know what that means, but it again, as with the unfunded mandate thing, it sounds like they're saying that uh, state uh, statutes or regulations or state rules and regulations wouldn't uh, apply to the municipalities until there's a public hearing held um, <clears throat> so it seems a little weird to me so so I don't know what to say this could be one of those things where there's just can ask for clarification yeah there's uh, just there's little in this law in this long document i think there's l little likelihood that the uh body is going to change its positions based on what we say but i still don't think that means we shouldn't argue for what's right yeah. okay and rosie had one. i must oh I, I must say from the discussion at the fair some decisions do get changed i mean there is major editing that happens yeah good yep uh, rosie takes hours. So reading through the public meeting law section, um, it just occurred to me that I I feel as a public servant that um, public meeting law could really be updated to make our meetings more effective and our work together more effective, um, particularly with regard to electronic communications. And it seems to me that there's no reason that um, a city couldn't have an electronic message board that was publicly visible through which we could communicate to each other and not have to wait for meetings to have these little, you know, um, <laughs> things that could be solved in a, a few messages back and forth, but we can't do that through email because it's not a public medium. So I, I, that's kind of a big thing, but I feel like League of Cities and Towns is well positioned to ask the legislature to do some thinking there about um, more efficient, uh, allowing, changing public meeting law to allow for some more efficient communications between public bodies. Um, and also thinking about uh, how does public meeting law apply to Front Porch Forum and Facebook and other electronic medium because there is a lot of room for opportunity there. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about open meeting laws and electronics. And what section was that in, Rosie? I think it's the 1.03. One okay. I think, yes. I got it. Okay. Anything else, team? Go A Hill. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you. 
Tell us how it goes. I'd be curious to hear, like, if it, or what gets changed. I'll give you the filtered, distilled version. That would be helpful. <laughs> the highlights. Uh, okay, so um, I think it might make some sense to go. I, I know I said, like, oh, we'll put communications at the end, but we could do, I think we could do it right now. Um, uh, short version, actually, let, let's just go to the Central Vermont Solid Waste District um, Municipal Service Programming Grant Program. Um, through further conversation, we just realized that if we wanted to do anything, even if it was just for compost, this grant um, was probably not going to be enough. And um, if we want to actually pursue this, we should have a more robust conversation and maybe even think, like, it is itself not a matching grant, but it's pro like, like I said, it's not enough to just do a feasibility study of, like, what if we just wanted to, what if we wanted to do just composting, even if we wanted to think about all three. Um, either way, $5,000 on our own would wasn't going to be enough, and if we collaborate with Barry, even 10000 actually may not be enough. So I just want to flag that for a future discussion. Um, think about, I, I want to put on your radars to think about as a potential future priority. Um, and maybe not, uh, like, but just give it a, I just want to put it out there. Um, and we can, we can talk more about it another time. That's it for now on that. There's another round of that deadline, which is May 1st. So we have, we have some time for that. Okay. Can we do the communications? Strategy update. Is that one urgent? No, I don't think so. Can we put that off? Can we, is that okay? We put it off till. Are, were you waiting just for that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, another time then. And uh, we're going to set the date for the second public hearing. We should probably wait until Ashley gets back. Uh, but the, there was something I was going to say about that. Oh, right. Be, um, uh, as we think about uh, what date we want to set for this special meeting, I mean, it, right now it's <laughs> for Halloween, 10:31. We should probably not do it then. No. That seems like a bad plan. Ooh, um, well. <laughs> yeah. No, no, but public hearing for the bond. Public, public hearing. hearing. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, it says we yes, cannot till the 27th the, of November. The bond. 5th. So, uh, and the it's only you know tentatively put on 1031 because it's Wednesday so if we can look at calendars to see when might work what are our limits again I kinda it's it's in the it's in the document it's in the memo um, I think through the 27th yeah I was gonna say the 26th 10 day limit is October 27th Oh, yeah. oh, there it is, right. Select a date between October 27th and November 5th. I read it three times. Yes, yes, you're, you're totally right there. Okay. Oh, gosh. My life is so complicated. Hold on. It does list eligible dates at the bottom. Okay, of the eligible dates... October 29, 30, and 31, and November 1st are Monday through Thursday, and November 5th is a Monday. Um, uh, let's just go through it. Um, 27th, anybody? Let me get back to my calendar. So. 20, October 27th? That's a That's Saturday. A weekend. Oh. Saturday. oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the wrong month. First weekday 29th. is the 29th. October. Which is what, put down here in the bottom 29th 30th we can do monday nights okay i'm sorry okay october 29th monday night is it thum thumbs up if you can do that one or hands whatever no connor cannot is that true i don't know you don't know okay so let's look to look at another one um the 30th no you don't know i might have something but i might not and i don't <laughs> so you guys, if that ends up being the best one, then we can... Okay, so maybe the Tuesday, but we'll come back. Not the 31st. No, we no. should not do that. Do um, that. November 1st. I teach Thursdays. Get? Public okay. safety authority. Okay, so two people are up for that. Um, November 5th. November 5th. Sorry, not, not November 5th. Oh, November 5th. 
Oh, oh, oh baby. Wait. Jack can't? Yeah. Oh, okay, so I think we have a winner. November 5th. A thumbs Is win. that like the old-fashioned doodle poll? <laughs> <laughs> It's like the analog. <laughs> it's like the doodle pole was made from. Okay, so we're going to say, no oh, say oh, remember, digital. remember. The 5th the of, of November. November. Guy okay. Fox. Guy Fox Day, right? Uh, okay, so um, 6.30? Sure. Okay, 6.30. Special council meeting, or hearing, really. Wait, is that, sorry, I'm just looking. The election is on the 6th. Is that? That's a good point. John, what do you think about that? I don't know enough about the, Mm -hmm. I trust Bill. Every time I sit down to go over it, mm -hmm. any kind of election deadline with Bill, he's like, oh, I've got it all mapped out here. I'm like, fine. I just uh, it's in this memo. It's, it's fine. I feel like from the public perspective, the day before the election is kind of late to be. I agree. The election is a good idea the That's a good point. Maybe you guys should go with the, the one that the 30th was work for everybody else, and I will try. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll do my best. The 30th. 30th. I can actually do the 29th, I think. I'm looking out of here. <laughs> Wait, where are we? Oh. The 29th, 29th. Is Monday. 29th? 29th? Yes. Oh, you were still a question. I don't know about either of those, but um, you, you could do the 29th. Do I think I can do that now, sir. You could do the 29th, but so it doesn't matter. Either one, I'm not sure. Either but one. I'll but try and make it work. So the 29th and the 30th are equally as good. Okay. Let me just raise a question. Yes. Is it really that important that we not do it on Halloween? Yes. Yeah, yes. for public <laughs> participation. <laughs> I yeah. like giving trick or treats out. I mean, six. Well, so do I. We just moved our office to College Street, so we just bought 800 pieces of candy for. <laughs> so we're not, not enough. It's not enough. Yeah, no, we, we can't. We can't do it. Um, uh, we let's go with the 29th. Wicked outfits. 29th, right. the 29th. Monday. 29th, 29th, and you Monday. see if you can make it, and hopefully that works out. Um, okay, again, 6:30. Um, council. Hearing. Okay. I think that wraps everything up. No other business. Council reports. Uh, Donna, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, I'm going to go home and finish my packing. I'm heading off to Sweden tomorrow. Mm -hmm. nice. And I will, I'm not sure what will happen with connecting with you on the 3rd, but I wish you all well with your vote and hope the parking garage does get voted to be on the November ballot. Thank you very much. All right. On Friday night, I got to fulfill a boyhood dream and do a uh, police ride along. Oh. Uh, it's super fun. <laughs> it was one of the best things I've ever done. Um, so I was paired up with Corporal <laughs> Philbrick there. Yes. And uh, I, it was kind of like just touching to hear w w how everybody got into law enforcement, you know. Uh, and sort of the distinction between cultures from community to community. And uh, we took a spin, looked for illicit behavior, didn't find any, which was a good thing, a couple taillights <laughs> out. Uh, but I, I was just left very grateful that we live in the place we do um, with this force here. Uh, it definitely wasn't focused on sort of punitive measures. Um, you could tell it was about helping people out as they walked by there. Um, so, no, that was great. I would encourage everybody to do it. Thanks. Uh, nothing to report other than tomorrow morning. I'll be at Baguito's, 8.30 to 9.30. Who would like to go, Rosie or Ashley? <laughs> no, um, nothing to report. Okay. Yes. Uh, there is a demonstration that is in the works for the State House Lawn Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Uh, the state just entered into a contract with Core Civic, which used to be Corrections Corporation of America, um, to house uh, our inmates there. So hopefully some folks can come out and join us. Oh, I think that's me next. Um, I'm going to pass. Nothing. Very quickly, Jamie will be in touch with you all. We're going to try, if we can, to put together a picture outside the city council. We usually do the annual picture lined up here in front of this, this wall. Or down there, yeah. Or down here. Yeah, yeah. And the goal is to try to get us somewhere outside in fresh air with fall foliage. We were so once under the, all the, the, the guy pictures. <laughs> Can we maybe, like, replace some of those pictures? Oh, yes. We're, we're, yes. There's no women up there. We were going to try to get that committee together to figure out what to do with them. Even if they were, they just need Maybe to be somewhere Maybe just like replaced. 
redistributed yeah. and like maybe a, a little more diversity. I think uh, we're still finding a date. What's that? Yeah, we'll we'll try again to find a date for that. The uh, I don't know what the official name of that crew is. The Better Art Group. So sure. if you want Connor to do this, it's right here in my drawer. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good response. Um, and sorry. What, <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so without objection, we're going to adjourn. It's approximately ten twenty-eight.